and I will say that again so you can hear me. <laughs> Welcome. I'd like to call the April 26, 2022 City Council meeting to order. May we have the roll call, please? Yes. Mayor Peck? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Hidalgo Fearing? Council Member Martin? Here. Council Member Waters? Here. Council Member Yarborough? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Hidalgo Faring is not with us tonight. She's, she's out. Um, so I have a reminder for the public that we are not able to live stream this meeting, but you can watch it at longmontpublicmedia.org. Anyone wishing to speak at first call public invited to be heard will need to add his or her name to the list outside the council chambers and only those on the list will be invited to speak at the first public invited to be heard. Let's all stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 12th, 2022? So moved. Thank you, that's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, seconded by uh, Councillor uh, Yarbrough. Um, let's vote. We need to take a pen vote because it's- uh, Oh, that's right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, we're going to vote tonight by hand rather than by, uh, by the system. There are a lot of things that are going to be a little different tonight, so bear with us. All those in favor of passing the minutes, raise your hand. All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Are there any agenda revisions or submissions of documents tonight? Mayor, the only thing that we had was the um, general business item 12B the 2022 legislative bill recommended for a council position that was added at a later date. Thank you. Uh, do any of the councilors have motions to direct the city manager to add items, agenda items to future agendas? Seeing none, we will go on to uh, the city manager's report. No report, no report Mayor, Council. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a special report tonight, a proclamation designating the week of May 15th to the 21st, 22, 2022 as National Police Week and further designating May 15th, 2022 as Peace Officers Memorial Day in Longmont, Colorado. So I'll read the proclamation and then if uh, whoever is accepting this proclamation will step forward. Um, a proclamation designating the week of May 15th, 20, I'm sorry, May 15th through the 21st, 2022 is National Police Week and further designating May 15th, 2022 as Peace Officers Memorial Day in Longmont, Colorado. Whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it falls as National Police Week, and whereas the members of the Longmont Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the residents of Longmont, Colorado, and whereas it is essential that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices, sacrifices of their law enforcement agency, and that members of our law, law enforcement agency recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, protecting against violence, disorder, deception, and oppression. And whereas the Boulder County Regional Peace Officer Memorial Service will be held at 4.30 p.m. on May 12th, 2022 at the Longmont Civic Center. Now therefore I, Mayor Joan Peck, and the City Council of the City of Longmont call upon all citizens of Longmont and all patriotic, civic, and educational organizations to observe the week of May 15th through the 21st, 2022 as Police Week with appropriate ceremonies and observances 
in which all of our people may join in in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who, by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities, have rendered a dedicated service to their communities, and in so doing, have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. I further call upon all citizens of Longmont to observe Sunday, May 15th, as P Peace Officers Memorial Day, in honor of those law enforcement officers who, through their courageous deeds, have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their com community or have become disabled in the performance of duty. And let us recognize and pay respect to the survivors of our fallen heroes. Would you care to say anything, officers? Mary. Morning, Mayor, or evening, Mayor and Council. I, I just want to say I'm been honored to work for this city for over 33 years, and uh, we have received great support in this community. And it's it, we really are honored to just work with all the people of this community every day. And and I know many of our officers are very appreciative of the support from the city and the city council. And you Thank are you. Detective Jeff Satter. Yeah. Deputy Chief. Deputy Chief. Yeah. Jeff Satter. Sorry about that. <laughs> and we, we are very fortunate to have you in our city as our Deputy Chief. <laughs> uh, Master Police Officer Ryan Douglas, I, I want to just echo what Chief Satter said that I appreciate. One, as an individual, two, as an employee, and three, as a police officer, uh, your support and the city's support. It's always been great. Um, I get far more compliments and words of appreciation than the other side of that coin um, as I am in the community and I just appreciate working here. Would you uh, take a picture with us as you accept this proclamation? And Mayor, I also heard, overheard, um, you wanted to reiterate it's at 4.30 p.m. on May 12th, the Longmont Civic Center. Yes, it is. Thank you. For some reason, I said May 15th, but that was incorrect. No, I think you got it. I just wanted to reiterate. May 5th, Sunday, May 15th is the um, actual day. Exactly. So May 12th. Thank you. So anybody who wants to attend that, uh, again, it's May 12th at the Civic Center, 4.30 p.m. Let's go on to our next presentation, which is the LEDP quarterly, first quarter of 2022 presentation.
There we go. Good evening, Mayor Peck and council members. Thank you for your patience. I'm Jessica Erickson, President and CEO of Longmont Economic Development Partnership, here to give our first quarter 2022 impact report. So I'll start by reminding you that the objectives in our economic development contract with the city of Longmont include strengthening Longmont's competitive position, marketing Longmont nationally and globally, supporting the creation and retention of quality jobs, advancing opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation, and advocating on behalf of all Longmont businesses. Our citywide economic development strategy, Advance Longmont II, establishes goals, objectives, and priorities in the focus areas of talent, industry, place, which is place making, transportation connectivity, and impact. The focus areas that Longmont EDP objectives within the contract with the city are in include talent, industry, and impact. So my report this evening will reflect our work towards those objectives related to the talent, industry, and impact focus areas, starting with talent. Our first talent objective within the city contract is marketing and recruiting, executing a focused marketing and recruiting recruitment campaigns directed at attracting new talent to our community. Our first quarter progress, we, base, we measure our success and our progress based on standard marketing KPIs, which include impressions, click-throughs, and uh, website visits. So we had just over half a million ad campaign impressions in the first quarter of 2022, with over 1,800 clicks through our ad campaign. The top five user locations for our marketing campaign are the top five places where people were engaging from, Colorado, Kansas, California, Maryland, and Virginia. We had over 6,500 unique users to our website in the first quarter with the top three ad groups based on clicks through being our general talent attraction ads, our business catalyst talent attraction ads, and our knowledge creation talent attraction ads. Nationally, Phoenix is pulling better than all other markets on our LinkedIn ad campaigns, and Los Angeles has the highest level of overall engagement on our Facebook ad campaigns. Denver, LA, and Orange County have the highest overall engagement across all our display advertising campaigns. Our second talent objective is our annual workforce perception study. Uh, no progress really to report here. That study will be conducted in 2022 with the results reported and published in, I'm sorry, in July 2022 with the results reported and published likely in August of 2022. Objective 2.1 in our contract is talent intelligence data. So that's gathering, aggregating, and reporting out industry demands and needs for talent and where we sit as a community relative to those needs for talent. So in order to aggregate that data as primary data, we have this year included 27 different talent needs assessment questions on our annual Elevate Primary, Biz primary Industry Retention Survey. This survey doesn't close until April 30th of this year. And so the survey analysis and reporting will come after that and we'll have some target industry specific insights that we'll be able to share with you as part of our Q2 2022 report. And then our final talent objective is supporting talent systems. So that's supporting our existent, existing talent systems, including workforce development, uh, Front Range Community College and St. Rain Valley School District. And we do this through ongoing direct referrals, as well as inclusion of their information in any prospect responses or RFP responses for industry prospects that we share. So when we look at a snapshot of all of our talent objectives within the city contract, marketing and recruitment, workforce perceptions, talent intelligence data, and supporting talent systems, we are on target to meet and achieve all of the objectives and goals set out within the contract. In the industry focus area, our first objective is primary industry growth. So we are, one of the uh, metrics that we have in there is completion of the update of the city's primary industry incentive policy. We have met with the city manager's office staff to continue the work on that. That was started in 2020, so we fully expect that that will come forward and you will see those recommendations in 2022, likely in the second quarter of 2022. The second objective is lead generation. So that's our ability to create interest among primary industry prospects nationally, regionally, and locally to consider Longmont as a place to relocate and expand. So we currently 
uh, it, or in Q1 of 2022, we did generate eight new primary industry prospect leads. Three of those were formal RFP responses that we participated in, in partnership with Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation and the State Office of Economic Development. So with those eight new prospects, we have 13 total carrying over several from 2021. Of all of those 13 product prospects, 2,400 potential net new jobs could be created if we were fortunate enough to win them all, $200 million in potential capital investment. A third of our active prospects are in our smart manufacturing industry cluster, and 90% of our prospects are in one of our four targeted industry clusters. So only 10% are in another industry cluster that's not part of our targeting strategy. Our next industry objective is business retention. So the retention, success, and growth of our existing primary industry employers. Our 2022 Elevate Longmont survey, which I mentioned earlier, our uh, primary industry retention survey closes on the 30th of this month. It was sent to 217 primary industry employers. Uh, you can see the follow-up and work that we've do done to achieve what we believe we'll be able to achieve, which is that 25 percent response rate that's within our contract. Our next industry objective is the administration of the grant funds from the city of Longmont. We had been for the last two years using them to grant funds to early stage companies that were going through the Innovate Longmont Accelerator Program. As we are pivoting Innovate Longmont to be the umbrella organization for the ramp facility, which is, as I've mentioned before, the manufacturing accelerator facility that we're working on. Uh, once we get that up and running, which we've secured the space for at this point in time, we'll transition those grants to be early stage startup grants for companies going through the ramp accelerator as opposed to the Innovate Accelerator. So when we look at a snapshot on the primary industry growth objective of updating the city incentive policy, uh, we put a maybe. Um, we're very confident that that will happen, but because the work has not been done yet, we don't want to count our eggs before they hatch. So that's still in the maybe category. And then similarly with our lead generation objective, I'm confident based on the activity that we've had now coming into the second quarter that we'll achieve the objective of 50 primary industry prospect leads. But basic math tells you that with eight leads in, tw in the first quarter, if we stay on that same path, that we're not meeting that objective at this point in time, that we're fully confident that we will as we progress throughout the year. And then our Elevate survey objective, we are meeting and exceeding. And then grant dollars, again, because we are not yet deploying those grant dollars, we're still in that maybe category in terms of whether or not we're meeting that objective. Again, not counting our eggs before they hatch. And then our final focus area of impact, the first is uh, Advanced Longmont 2.0 Collective Impact Backbone Support, so serving as that backbone organization to the Advanced Longmont 2.0 Strategic Initiative Working Group work. Um, we held a strategy alignment retreat and have held 33 initiative support meetings with 11 future initiative structure building meetings scheduled. We developed a, or we're working on development of a new initiative proposal portal with community readiness guide expected to launch later in this quarter of 2022 and we've added four new advanced on what 2.0 steering committee partners in uh, that are joining in q2 of 2022 current advanced long 2.0 collective impact initiatives are accessible and affordable child care prosper longmont was which is the attainable housing initiative the river district and then no wrong door ecosystem for entrepreneurs pipeline initiatives that are being worked on for potential future advanced on what 2.0 collective impact initiatives are the interest city shuttle system and again the ramp uh, industry accelerator or manufacturing industry accelerator facility our second impact objective is the collective data dashboard which uh, has launched and is available on the advanced longmont website so if you go to advanced.longmont.org we now have a real-time data dashboard that's tracking the data that was included in the original market assessment that uh, was is what contributed to the advanced development of the advanced on 2.0 strategy. 
And then finally, our Aspire Leadership Council, our goal is to grow that to 40 members. We have 30 members as of March 31st, so as of the end of the second quarter. New members include Redwire Aerospace and Bond Commercial Properties. The Aspire Leadership Council, as I've mentioned before, does have their own pool of funding that they use to fund special projects and strategic initiatives. We have had no new projects funded in the first quarter of this year, though we have a couple pending for the second quarter of this year, both related to Advanced Somewhat 2.0. All right, so our impact snapshot, AL 2.0 backbone support or Advanced Somewhat 2.0 backbone bone support. We believe that we're on track to meet the objectives there. The collective data dashboard, as I mentioned, is done. It's up and running. And then our Aspire Leadership Council, again, we put in that maybe category. We want to get to 40. We're at 30, not counting our eggs. Uh, but we are confident that we'll get to 40 members of our Aspire Leadership Council and the funding that is associated with that. Right, so overall economic indicators, the city of Longmont or the Longmont area has about a $6.7 billion economy. In 2021, we started the year with uh, just over 55,000 jobs and having seen 2.5% employment growth over the previous five years. That counts the dip, the loss in uh, 2020 and 2021 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. When we look forward to January 2022, so to this year, from 2021, we're net, we were at just over 56,000 jobs, so a 3.5% year-over-year increase in jobs. And as of the end of the first quarter of 2022, we're at about a 3.8% unemployment rate. We look at a couple of other economic indicators, including residential real estate. Median home sale prices in March of 2022 in the city of Longmont were $675,000. And as you can see from the comparative cities that we are still, shockingly, the affordable Boulder County from a home sale price perspective. 105 homes sold with 108 on the market or listed in March of 2022, which is significantly lower than historical, but as you can see, still better than some of our neighboring communities. Then we look at commercial real estate. So, and this is Q4 2021 data. It's the most current data that's available through our data source catalyst. But in Q4 2021, we had just over 9,000 square feet of absorption of office space with a 10.5% vacancy rate and 100, about 135,000 square feet of office space vacant with average asking rental rates of just over $16 per square foot. And that's on a triple net basis. Industrial real estate saw absorption of over 136,000 square feet with 538,000, almost 539,000 still vacant, but a vacancy rate of 7.23%. It would come as no surprise that we have a much more significant industrial real estate market here in Longmont than we do an office real estate market in Longmont. And that I believe is the end of my presentation and I will happily take your questions. Great, that was great. Um, thank you for that presentation. It looks like uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez is. Uh... Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Pack, and, and thank you, Jessica, for the presentation. Um, so, first thing, just a couple of clarifications. Uh, the median family income cited is for a two income household. That is, yes, that's a median household Approximately $116,000. Yes, so, yes, okay. yes. So generally speaking, would be a two-income household. There are very few single-income households Okay. Um, <laughs> in that range. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I figured as much, so I yeah. just wanted to, to make sure that was clear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then so when we're talking about bringing in jobs, um, be it primary employers or, or secondary, uh, would these – be jobs actually created or maybe jobs taken from other uh, municipalities, be it out of state even, mm -hmm. uh, would these be jobs poached, if you will? Sure. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez, Mayor Peck, thank you for the question. I, I won't say that jobs are never poached. I will tell you that from a Metro Denver region perspective, we very proactively do not poach jobs from other communities. We can't tell a company that if they find it preferable to move from one side of the county line to the other, 
in either direction. We can't tell them not to, but we don't incentivize that. And then from a national perspective, most of the projects that we're working on are expansion projects. So expansions of companies. So the creation of jobs that do not exist anywhere. So a good example of that would be um, Smuckers, AGC, Light Deck. Those are all net new jobs, not just to Colorado, but to the planet because they're jobs that don't currently exist anywhere else because they're resulting from expansion of a company or establishment of a new company. Thank you, because that's actually a very good point in the sense that I want to uh, explain to our constituents sometimes that it's not just that we're we're taking companies from other places. We're you know we're hosting the expansion of those companies, as you just said. So that's great. Uh, and then my last question is, when it comes to your recruiting um, marketing. Is there a balance between uh, the talent that we need and then how you're recruiting them in your marketing uh, materials? Mm -hmm. and, and so are, are you continually trying to keep that balance, you know, knowing what jobs are needed here based on our employers versus uh, necessarily say there's always a, a push and pull between, uh, you know, folks leaving the industry and, and coming into the industry? Thank you for that question, Councilmember Rodriguez. I'm excited to answer that question. Uh, we take a very data-oriented approach to our marketing, in particular to our marketing for talent from across the country. Uh, so what we do as part of our Elevate Longmont survey, as well as part of a significant investment we make in labor market and talent data on an annual basis is we really get an assessment of down to the occupation codes, what are the what is the talent that is needed by the industry that exists here today? And then we look at the rest of the country and we identify markets in the rest of the country that have what we call an oversupply of that talent. So graduating more people or have already in the market more people of that within that occupation than what their industry demands. And then we assess whether or not we consider ourselves as having a competitive advantage, whether that be a cost of living or quality of life or uh, industry cluster advantage over those locations. And so we've narrowed it down to about a half a dozen markets across the country where all of those things are true. And we are targeting that talent that is an oversupply within that geography to address the needs of the undersupply that we have here within our geography. Councilor Waters. Thanks, Mayor Peck. Uh, two questions, Jessica. The first, uh, as we find our kind of, I hope we're finding our way out of the mm -hmm. pandemic era into the post-pandemic future, biggest challenges that we ought to be aware of that you're facing or that you're going to have to overcome to achieve your, those objectives to have a kind of a killer year? Yes, thank you, Councilman Waters, Mayor Peck. Uh, I think it comes as no surprise that the answer to that question is the cost of housing. Uh, in this market in particular, we are, I think at last I heard, the fifth most expensive market in the country for housing. And so every single employer that we talk to, whether they be already here or considering locating here, has expressed concern over that and the need to address that challenge. As I mentioned, when we look at markets that we're targeting our market to for talent, we're looking for a competitive advantage, which in most cases would be cost of living, quality of life type competitive advantage. And there are fewer and fewer markets for now, in fact, that we have that cost of living competitive advantage over as a region. How much of an issue, I know uh, commercial space is also office space of all types or warehouse manufacturing mm -hmm. space has been an issue. Does that remain one of the challenges? It does remain one of the challenges. However, that is being addressed. There is a significant uh, number of square footage of new industrial development that will be coming out of the is coming out of the ground currently, or will be coming out of the ground in the coming months and next couple of years. That will address that challenge for the for the long term. So we have places for our companies to grow into. Great. So the the second question, really mapping onto the first, is if just fill in the blank. If we could just do X it would substantially increase our opportunity to raise all the boats that we'd like to raise with our economic development efforts. Thank you, Councilman Waters. I, I mean, I've said it a thousand. It's the attainable housing, the workforce price housing issue, and in particular, um, and specifically, uh, housing that provides an opportunity to 
get into home ownership and create wealth for one's family and uh, uh, generational wealth transfer over time. Thanks. And I will say nobody has solved that right, so we're not alone. But if we could figure that out, we would be ahead of the rest for sure. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, I just want to clarify, uh, we are the fifth most uh, expensive market, and you didn't really define what the region is. Could you explain that uh, so that we all know what the playing field is? Uh, the Boulder County MSA, so the Boulder MSA Metropolitan Statistical Area, which is really Boulder County, um, is the fifth most expensive housing market in the country. Okay. And so while we are in the fifth most expensive market, we are the most affordable version most of that. Most affordable <laughs> municipality. Yes. But that's not very affordable. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, but I do also have a question for you as mm -hmm. housing in all of your reports seems to be the number one barrier to getting employers here. Um, have you, when you approach businesses or they approach uh, Longmont, you in particular, uh, to relocate here or to start here, do you, do you ask them to help us with housing? Uh, for example, uh, Costco has been great in, in being able to get that nine acres. Um, for example, maybe uh, partnering with a developer who is going to build to uh, invest in that development for some of their employees, not all of them, not the whole development, but a portion of that to, to help us get the housing that we need for them. <laughs> so... Thank you, Mayor Peck, for that question. Um, so that ha has some different answers. So yes, we have several of our larger employers in the city that are part of the conversation about how they can contribute to solving the challenge of workforce attainable housing for their ability to continue to attract and retain talent here. However, when we're talking to companies that are considering expanding into this market that don't already exist here, um, they have lots of places that they can go. So they don't need to invest in building housing here when they can go to the middle of the country and um, be in an environment where housing is affordable to their employees. So it's not necessarily a conversation that we're having on, on the front end when we're trying to recruit a company here because that's a disadvantage for us. Um, in terms of attracting and recruiting new companies to our community. But absolutely, companies like, uh, you see Eric Wallace here, Left Hand Brewing Company, uh, uh, UC Health, uh, Seagate, and several others are all part of the conversation about addressing the challenge of uh, workforce housing and what they can contribute to that. Great. Thank you for that, because it does have to be a full community effort. It can't just be the city council trying to build... But the other thing about the affordability of this region is that we're pretty cool. People want to live here. Um, and that also drives the market up. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a challenge, and I'm, uh, I'm happy that you are looking at that. Thank, Thank you. you. So we are now on to public invited to be heard. Uh, do we have a list? Oh, thank you, Michelle. So uh, speakers who have not placed their name on this list outside uh, the council chambers will, will not be called upon, but you'll have the opportunity to talk uh, or to speak during public hearing items this evening or at the final public uh, the call for the public invited to be heard. So we will start tonight with, an, I apologize if I mess up your name, apologize in advance, Kathleen Cadenach. <laughs> Catnack. It's oh, way, easier. Oh. way easier than it looks. Good evening, Mayor Peck and City Council members. My name is Kathleen Catnack. I'm a member of POPS, Protect Our People and Property. I'm here tonight to thank you for your attention to and cooperation with our committee as we attempt to make Longmont a safer community. As you know, this month is the driest April on record since the 1880s. We are in a serious drought, and it doesn't look like the situation is going to improve anytime soon. 
Boulder County has implemented level one fire restrictions, which among other things, bans the use of all personal fireworks. The countywide ban is for the unincorporated areas of Boulder County. This is confusing because we're in the city's jurisdiction, not the county's. Public education is needed to explain the difference and consistency in the regulations would help. In light of our extreme fire danger, I'm asking that you follow Boulder County's level one fire ban, which includes completely banning the use of all personal fireworks. Please join with the numerous other cities who have also banned fireworks during this time. I also ask for a new fireworks ordinance that will be easier to enforce, including not requiring residents to testify in court against their neighbors, and that will also increase the fines and permit the confiscation of illegal fireworks. Thank you again so much for all your attention to this matter. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Ramona is the next one. Hello, I'm Ramona Giroux, a member of a group called Pop Long. Ramona, um, excuse me, would you mind giving us your address too, please? Yes, I don't want anyone to find me, but I will. Oh. 1803 18th <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> We're concerned about our very dry climate trends and want to protect Longmont citizens and their property from fire. Here is a quote from Jennifer Balch, a fire scientist and director of the Earth Lab at CU. If you don't want to burn down your neighbor's home or start a wildfire that threatens entire towns, then just avoid fireworks. Uh, this quote is from a public warning signed by 100 fire scientists. Philip Aguera, a professor of fire ecology at the University of Montana, who helped author the warning, said, most wildfires, unsurprisingly, occur close to homes. Fireworks tend to cause the most dangerous blazes. We have a law that is in place to protect the public from illegal fireworks for a reason. They belong in trained, licensed, and professional hands, not in the middle of our neighborhoods. We are asking the city to ensure our safety by creating an ordinance that can be easily enforced. We know that it is difficult when people call you and are unpleasant. Remember that these individuals believe that they are above the law. They are asking you to endorse them breaking our law and therefore put our town at risk of fire and health issues. I canvassed my neighborhood and learned that last year, along with illegal fireworks, a cannon was being shot off in our neighborhood. There are children living close by and their parents do not want this. Per the CDC, loud noise at a close range can permanently damage the hearing of children and adults. The smoke that is produced makes it difficult for those with asthma to breathe. Another neighbor mentioned the grasslands directly behind his house as a potential source of fire. It used to be an organic farm, but is no longer being worked and often the grass is very high. While most of the citizens of Longmont observe the law, a minority of the population is not doing so, and that is unfair to the rest of us. The current population of Longmont is estimated at 99,436. If there are 50 unlicensed fireworks displays that might have five participants each, that is 250 people. If there are 100, then that is 500 people, and so on. This small percentage of our population must not be allowed to put our lives, our property, our children, and our health in danger. In closing, I will say that I'm proud of living in Longmont and proud of the many good things the city council and the city employees have achieved. Our group wants to be a part of the solution and we are willing to volunteer as efforts are made to educate the community and resolve these issues. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Thanks, Ramona. The next person is Brian Johnston. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Brian Johnson at 926 Kaufman. And uh, before I speak about the 12A fireworks ban, I uh, want to let you know that I had a reporter saw me present last week in regards to the car stereo noise ordinance. Reach out to the article today. It was in the Longmont Leader, so please check it out. I want to thank Council Member Martin for her, in, her, her input on the article. And I um, just want to say that I'm just trying to get the extreme violators addressed. That's it. I think just some signage underneath the existing no cruising signs that read car stereo ordinance strongly enforced might be sufficient enough to get it to reasonable levels. I also wanted to offer that any of you think it's not that big a deal, I wanted to offer to help you with your research. Um, you like 90s gangster rap, Dr. Waters? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I do. I can come by after the meeting, sit in your house, sit outside your house for a couple hours and rock the windows and let you experience what some of us hear 16 hours a day at certain times. So if you need me to bring, come by with some Biggie Smalls or Wu-Tang and bump your windows, I, I can do that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would never do that to you, doctor. Um, in regard to 12A, I thought it, when I saw this was coming up, I pulled up, this is the current drought map most recently posted. Um, nowhere in the state's in white. Everywhere has a drought at some level. It's extreme in southwest and 30-day projections so that extremity moving northwards. Um, this is something I've been tracking over the past couple of years that I kind of did on my own and Google Maps uh, did it. This is what's burned in just the past couple of years around here between Cowwood and a couple of the other big ones. This, this excludes the Table Mesa fire from like a month ago, the fire north of Lyons just a couple weeks ago, and one we just had off North 75th, what, last week, week before. There's a lot of land that's been burned in the past, in, in, in recent times. And then lastly, she already, she beat me to, on this, but this was the, this is the current Boulder County fire restrictions. If you look at the very bottom where I highlighted in red, sale use possession of fireworks is impermissible. So I just wanted to add that based on the current and projected risk of fire, that it's a no brainer that you ban fireworks. And should things change prior to the 4th, maybe you could lift it. If we get rain the week before, you could consider lifting it. But the way things stand now, it's dangerous. It's, 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 it's a risk, and, um, and I think it's a no-brainer that, that, that you ban them. So thanks for your time, and I appreciate your public service as always. Thank you, Brian. Britton Cut. Cottrell? Thank you, Mayor, City Council members. My name is Britton Cottrell. I live at 4327 West 31st Street. Um, I'm in Greeley, Colorado. And uh, I'm here tonight just to uh, let you know, I, I do work for the firework industry. I work for TNT Fireworks. Um, we do work with local nonprofits here in uh, Longmont, and uh, we sell state-authorized neighborhood-friendly fireworks. I know there's a significant <clears throat> realization that we're in a, a dry period right now, um, and, and we don't know what that's going to do. It may trend dry, but um, I want to just let you know that not only in partnership with our nonprofit groups um, that work diligently selling fireworks, they understand the risks, and we all care about our state. I, I want you to know that coming from the industry. We have been working as an industry with the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control um, to address these issues uh, this year. We actually started last year working closely with the governor's office as well. And uh, let me just make a statement that although we think that it's easy to make an enforcement of banning all fireworks, um, we know that that is almost impossible to do. And data shows that when you ban fireworks and you prohibit even the safe and sane local fireworks that are designed to you know, be lit in your driveway or in your street, that's what state approved Colorado fireworks do, people will go out and find their fireworks somewhere else. And those are not state approved. They're brought in from somewhere else. Oftentimes, uh, when they're afraid of getting caught, they will now light those fireworks in places that are even more unsafe. Rather than lighting them in their driveway in a controlled area, they're now lighting them off their back porch or they're in their, their backyard or they're going out of the city limits. I've talked with numerous sheriffs, um, several elected officials, state and local officials all over the state who agree that the problem is not lighting a sparkler in your driveway. The issue is illegal fireworks. It's the things that leave the ground and explode. 
And I just want to bring attention to the idea that uh, an all-out ban of all fireworks is not necessarily the proper solution. Think about the things that have been prohibited in years past. Uh, take substances that you tell somebody, you cannot do this, and what do they do? They immediately respond. And granted, it may be a small number of people, but those people often cause the problems. And so what we would like to do as an industry is the same thing that we have been doing with the state of Colorado and other local municipalities to partner with you on a robust safety and education campaign. We can't have anybody misusing any type of firework, legal or illegal, in our state right now. The best thing that we can do is unite as an industry and, and with safety professionals to educate people in the proper way. Perhaps finding places that we encourage people to light that are safe. Uh, perhaps uh, telling them of how to dispose of fireworks correctly, how and where to purchase safe fireworks that have been designed to use in dry climates and in, in uh, tight spaces uh, in your neighborhood. So we just want to let you know as an industry that we're here to make ourselves available as a resource for your community and uh, for our state as a whole. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Britton. Uh, Aaron Kelvins. Collins. I hope I got that right. Calkins. Calkins. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Aaron Calkins, uh, 13201 East 144th Avenue. I also uh, am in the fireworks industry. I'm with Freedom Inc., uh, Old Glory Fireworks. Uh, have a location or two here in the Longmont area as well. Um, of course, I work with Britain um, in conjunction with the state on this, uh, this mutual education campaign that we've started last year, uh, brought on by the state actually. Um, and Division of Fire has um, you know, uh, agreed to uh, at least repeat and, uh, and probably go further with the campaign this year than what was done last year, um, including um, education to not only the public but to uh, people such as yourselves. We've realized here in the last few years that a lot of times we're speaking at something like this and as much as we try to uh, show you what we sell as Colorado Legal Fireworks, that there's some misconception that the fireworks that are being complained about are what we're selling in, our, in, this, in this jurisdiction. So, so he's already explained um, in a little bit of detail, but, but what, we're, what we're selling is novelty items, um, fountains low to the ground, nothing is going to leave the ground and go up in the air, uh, smoke items, sparklers, things such as that. So what we're trying to say is, and that's what he hit on, is you are going to be told that you're banned from buying those Colorado legal items, especially in these last few years. People have proven that they want fireworks and they're going to celebrate in some way with fireworks. If they are to leave and go buy them elsewhere, it's pr especially up north here, it's probably going to be Wyoming. We just want you to know that when you're in Wyoming and you're buying from one of those locations, it's not the products that we're selling here. It's not the loaded the ground uh, fountains or smoke. That's the aerials. So probably here, I, I read where there was quite a few calls last year and complaints. A lot of people used fireworks last year. Um, probably the way to word it is, if you've seen a firework that you want to complain about, it's probably an illegal firework. You wouldn't even see the fireworks that we are selling because they are not exceeding that high in the air. Um, so once again, we're here, uh, we haven't even heard your opinion on this or what, what you're thinking on this. We just wanted to make sure you know we're here and want to be a part of it. We'd love to help educate the public with our locations and our, uh, our customers and uh, just know that we're here. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Susan Alling. Susan Alling, 640 Gooseberry Drive. I am president of the Senior Advisory Board. I've started as an alternate there, and the advisory board is unanimous in supporting the amendment to change the makeup of the board to nine full-time board members. It would get a few more people involved and make for an easy majority, and we're also on board with doing interviews as suggested by the city council where probably two of us would be a part of the interview process. Thank you, that's good to know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Bruce Hollick.
Good evening, Mayor Peck, City Council, Congressman, or Councilman Waters. My name is Bruce Halleck. I live at 2426 Santa Fe Drive in Longmont, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Villas at Pleasant Valley. I spoke with you last on the 29th of March about the health hazards of Spring Gulch 2, which is part of city property, which drains Outlot A, which is a piece of property which the Villas owns. However, it is also a surcharge area from the city for your 100-year floodplain. Uh, at that time, I suggested that we needed to proceed with the engineering to be able to correct the problem with drainage. Talked about uh, last time the money that was being provided to various states for pandemic aid. About two weeks later, if you remember, the uh, Denver Post had an interesting article that the state had received $66 billion, about 11300 per resident. I had urged, had urged you then, and I continue to urge you now, go to the state, go to the federal government, let's work together to get some grant funds to get this work done. This is a serious health hazard. We've already heard tonight about the serious drought we have. We all know about it. If you remember the Kaiser Permanente article last time, talked about drought causes a congestion of bird in smaller areas. Birds transmit these viruses and West Nile virus. Then the mosquitoes contract it from the birds and we get it to humans. As I reminded you, I survived the attack that I had last August, mm -hmm. okay? I spent a month in the hospital, two months in rehabilitation. Thank goodness, my good health and the rest of it, I survived. The other gentleman who I cited in that article did not make it. He died in November last year. So these are, health hazards are serious and they're gonna grow in serious. This is, the drought causes a number of problems. Fire causes health and we need to sort of, I understand you've got a lot of things to deal with, but we need to focus much effort as we can on trying to improve the drainage out of that lot A. We'll work with you. The villas, we're, we're prepared to assist, do whatever we can, but we certainly can't you know, without your input, your design, because you, it's your drainage area, without that design information and applying for permits to the Corps of Engineers because they call it a wetland, we could get their permit approval on the basis of the health hazard it imposes. So I'm not restricted by, you know, not concerned that the Corps of Engineers is going to deny it. But I need your help, Mayor. I need you to work with Council, and I know that uh, the Councilman uh, Waters is already working on this issue to try to get, and we'll, we'll bring more people in, I'll bring more help in, we'll need it to okay. get this done. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you, Bruce. Um, that is it for public invited to be heard. Um, do we need a break, uh, a bio break, anyone up here? Okay, we'll continue. Looks like we're good to go. We are now going to have the consent agenda. Um, Michelle, would you mind reading the items into the consent agenda? Nope, no problem. Um, so the consent agenda, ordinances on the agenda will be set for a second reading and public hearing on May 10th, unless otherwise noted following the item title. Um, item 9A, O 2022-16, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 2.84, Point zero two zero of the Longmont Municipal Code on the Senior Citizens Advisory Board. Item 9B, O 2022-17, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 11.04, Section 11.04.140 uh, of the Longmont Municipal Code on the extension of the traffic safety surcharge. Item 9C, Resolution 2 uh, 2022-63, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of and Boulder County Public Health for the Genesis Project Teen Parenting Services. Item 9D, resolution 2022-64, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the amended and restated special council contract between the City and Kissinger and Fellman, PC for Telecommunications, Railroad and Transportation Special Council Services. 9E, R-22-65, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Union Reservoir Recreational Lease between the City of Longmont and the Union Reservoir Company. 9F, R-22-66, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving an intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County for a voter service and polling center use agreement for the 20, 2022 election section. Sorry, 2022 election. 9G, 
R2022-67, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the inter intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Longmont Housing Authority to provide community development block grant funding for the Christman 2 Apartments Project. 9H, R-2022-68, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Longmont Housing Authority to provide American Recovery Act funding for the Christman 2 Apartments Project. 9I, R-2022-69, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Longmont Housing Authority to provide American Recovery Act funding in the form of a loan for the Christman 2 Apartments Project, Public Improvement Financial Securities. Thank you, Michelle. And I see that staff would like to pull 9G, 9H, and 9I. Do, are there any other uh, counselors that want to pull any other items? Okay, then can I have a motion to pass the consent agenda minus G, H, and I? So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Uh, that has been moved by Councillor uh, Martin and seconded by Councillor um, Yarbrough. All those in favor? Kind of is. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? So that passes unanimously with Councillor Hidalgo Faring absent. So we'll move now to items on the uh, second, ordinances on second reading and public hearing on any matter. If anybody in the public would, would like to speak on this item, um, we will call on you uh, as soon as I read it. It is ordinance 2022-15, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2022. Do we have a staff report on this ordinance? No. So uh, do we have anybody from the public? I would open the public hearing on this ordinance 2022-15. Seeing none, I will uh, uh, open it up for questions from council. Seeing none, can I have a motion uh, to pass 2022-15? So moved. So that has been moved by Mayor Pro Tem uh, Rodriguez, seconded by Councillor Waters. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, that passes with Councillor Hidalgo Faring absent. So we are now going to have a public hearing to consider action on amendment number 2101 to the 2021 CDBG action plan. Do we have a staff report on this? Thank you. Mayor Peck, members of council, thank you for having us tonight. This I'm Molly O'Donnell, Housing and Community Investment Division Director for the city. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, just briefly describe this CDBG funding action plan amendment. A total of $60,471.97 is being repurposed in this amendment from 2021 funding that was originally intended towards providing security and utility deposits for the housing solutions of Boulder County coordinated entry participants to provide security, the, the security and utility deposit program. That program ended up getting funded by the locally funded voucher program, and therefore the CDBG funding is no longer needed, and therefore we are going to propose to move that funding over the Crispin Two Apartments Acquisition Project, um, which you'll be hearing more about tonight. Um, and that's an addition to their, addition, their original CDBG allocation. So we are required to bring this forward for public hearing um, if we have a change in eligible activities or the number of beneficiaries to be served, which this does in both ways. Are there any questions from council on this ordinance? Seeing none, I would open it up for the public hearing uh, if you have any questions or comments on this ordinance. Seeing none, um, all those in favor of passing the Ordinance to consider action on amendment 2101 to the 2021 CDBG action plan. Please raise your hand. I second the motion. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So that motion was made by me, Mayor Preck, and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem 
Rodriguez. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? That passes with Councillor Susie Hidalgo Faring being absent. So now we'd move to the items removed from the consent agenda by staff, uh, 9G, which is the resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Longmont Housing Authority to provide community development block grant funding. That was what you just did. So what we just passed was resolution 2022-67. No, Mayor, um, this is a separate action item. That was the hearing that we were required to have. And if, if we could, um, we would like to take G, H, and I together. Um, can we do that? Okay. If you want, I can go ahead and talk for why, why staff had to, wanted to pull these items. Yes, please. Okay. So um, item G was the resolution 2022-67. Um, for the CDBG funding for Christmas 2 Apartments Project 2022-68 um, was the American Recovery Act funding for the Christmas 2 Project. Um, and 2022-69 um, is the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Longmont Housing Authority to provide ARPA uh, American Recovery Act funding in the form of a loan for the Christmas 2 Apartments Project, public improvement financial securities. That's actually the reason we wanted to pull these three is to really go over that because that is something that we haven't talked to council about. Uh, but we wanted to grab all three of these items so that Molly could talk through it and then I'll be jumping in as well into this conversation if needed. Okay. Molly. Mayor Peck, members of council, Molly O'Donnell once again. Um, so the Chrisman One apartments were completed in 2018 by MGL developers and those provided 114 new affordable apartment homes in Longmont. MGL and the Longmont Housing Authority have teamed up as co-developers for the second phase of development. Chrisman 2 will construct 83 new apartment homes, affordable apartment homes, available for households of, with incomes between 30 and 60% of the area median income, with the units serving an average AMI of 50.48%, which is, which is quite good for a project of this type. Chrisman 2 will be located just north of the Chrisman 1, near the intersection with State Highway 66 in Maine. The two developments will be connected with common amenities and um, common design and aesthetics. Chrisman 2 was awarded 4% low-income housing tax credits in 2021. And the closing on the land acquisition and the financing package is targeted to complete by mid-June 2022, with construction starting immediately after. By 2028, LHA will assume ownership of all 197 units. The total project cost for Christman 2 is about $27 million. For every dollar of city funds put into that project, $19 is invested in Longmont's affordable housing stock. So the total city funding into the project, considering the resolutions up for consideration tonight, um, is just over $2 million, at about $2,052,000 and change. That consists of an affordable housing fund loan of 600,000 to pay for pre-development costs, and that goes, that's direct, direct to MGL. Then tonight's, one of tonight's considerations, the CBG grant of 402,915.97 to fund the acquisition of the land, including the amendment to the CBG action plan you just approved. The ARPA grant of $875,000 towards acquisition. So 800,000 was originally improved by council in January out of the ARPA allocation, but due to construction cost escalation, an additional $75,000 was needed to fill the gap to get to closing. And additionally, this ARPA loan of a hunt up to 175,000 to pay for financial securities for public improvements on behalf of the development partnership. And I'm gonna circle back, that to, back to that in just a moment. Additionally, the city will provide fee waivers and offsets to the project, and LHA is slated to extend its property tax exemption, resulting in an estimated $543,000 in additional value. So the loan for the financial, security, financial securities for the public improvements is unique. So the current estimation for the public securities is at a cost of $104,943, which is a cost that it's included in the financing deal. So we need it incorporated in the budget at closing. Typically, this is necessary to ensure that if the project fails to complete the public improvements, the city has a funding source to complete the work. But low-income housing tax credits or LIHTC projects have deep capital funding stacks. 
Once a project closes on that financing, the chances of the project failing to complete construction are extraordinarily low. If the city loans LHA the funding for the securities, it would help close the gap created by construction cost escalation and help reduce the amount of cash needed to close. Once the public improvements are completed to the satisfaction of the city, LHA would pay back the loaned funds and they could be reallocated to the next ARPA project on the city's list before that obligation deadline at the end of 2024. If the securities in the, in the unlikely event that the securities are drawn upon, ARPA funds would not be repaid to the city, but would benefit the project still and would still be put towards an uh, eligible use under ARPA. Or the LHA Board of Commissioners could, can, may, may choose to enter into a repayment agreement with MGL to safeguard the funds. And that board can consider that at a future time. So a couple of items to kind of distill this down. So um, do you need to have a seat? Okay. So when we were looking at this and, and they were building the capital stack, um, the security showed themselves at the end of the project. Um, and I think part of that was because, um, I'm not sure exactly, but I think uh, the development partner was used to not paying securities on affordable housing in other communities. So I don't, I think they, it just wasn't included. When it came in, um, if you remember when we got the additional million dollars from the Department of Housing, we still said there was another $375,000 gap. And so what we got concerned with in this is when you added the 100,000 into it, it started creating issues with the loan document. Um, I think more importantly, and Molly, correct me if I'm wrong, when you look at it and you were to include the $100,000 into the loan, it gets caught up in the waterfall in terms of how people get paid back. And, and so what that means is that we're, it would be what, fourth or fifth, Molly? So if we loaned it into the partnership, it would be fifth on the waterfall, so last to be paid back. So it would be the last to be paid back, so that would mean that you probably wouldn't get the money back until you resyndicate it in 20 to 25 years. Mm. We didn't want to get that money trapped in the waterfall provision in terms of the affordable housing loan. So we looked at this process, which is essentially ARPA loaning the securities, and we did go beyond the initial estimates because if we need to pull early building permits, then you have to actually uh, provide securities at 150% versus the 100% security. So that would go up estimated 30 or $40,000. We pushed it to 175 in case there, there was something there. So what would happen is we would, um, the, the city via the ARPA funds would loan the money to the housing authority. The housing authority would pay the securities. Once they finish and they get construction acceptance, the, the city would then pay the housing authority back the money that we put in securities. The housing authority would then pay the city back to the ARPA fund, the securities, um, and it keeps it out of that waterfall so you can turn that money faster into another project versus it getting caught up in, in, in the repayment process. And based on where we were today with this project, that was the most expedited way that we could deal with the financial shortfall that this accounted for um, and not get it caught up in, in the overall loan document for Christman II. That's what we wanted to talk to you all today about and, and why we wanted to bring it out because it is a bit different. But um, when we were working on this and placed it on the agenda item, we were shooting for closing next week or the end of this week next week. There were some other things that came up which pushed it back, but we still need that ready so we can actually go to closing. I'd be happy, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, so to me, that sounds like most of the presentation was based more on uh, Resolution 2022-69 versus 68, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the ARPA fund allocation is concerned. Correct. Uh, correct. Okay. Correct. Good. Uh, so my question then is, for at least 68, we'll talk about that first, because 69 seems like there's some repayment mechanisms, which are, you know, very uh, pleasant to talk about in this in this conversation but for for uh 68 that's straight up a, i believe seventy five thousand dollars right eight hundred and seventy eight hundred seventy five thousand dollars uh 
so that 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 will affect the other projects that were on that list that we talked about. The eight hundred thousand was on the list for Christmas. Right, but the additional the, the seventy five thousand. That's why I said seventy five thousand. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, it, it is. Um, we are seeing some cost savings and some other line items where we can balance that out. Okay. And so part of the impetus of this is that Christman is the closest to uh, feasibility, right? Correct. Versus the other items that were on that list, right? Correct. Uh, so my worry is that uh, where we take that 75000 from in, in reallocating the priority list, if you will, uh, in the sense that we are seeing uh, an immediate need to continue to address the unhoused population and the homelessness population. So in that concept, I would very much advocate for the fact or advocate that we do not reallocate any money from that particular tranche, if you will, uh, of funding. Um, and that maybe we take from some, some projects that are further down the line that we might be able to, you know, come back and, and find some, some different ways to make that whole and make, make that work for us all. Um, and so, because we also know that regardless of how the funding works, transitional housing is really specifically what we need. And it's not so much just funding the construction of that housing, but also the operation and maintenance is an extremely important part uh, of how we, we talk about the, the transitional housing or the, you know, unhoused and homeless population. Um, as far as, uh, Resolution 2022-69, I think you've explained it very clearly. I agree with that, you know, um, strategy, if you will. And I'm very much in support of making Chrisman go forward as, as fast as possible because uh, affordable housing is ultimately also a key part of the strategy to the unhoused and homeless population as well. Um, so I just was trying to, make, like I said, make it clear that I would prefer not to have anything taken out of the tranche that we've allocated in our previous conversations for homelessness and unhoused. Um, at, as such, I, I don't know if we need to move them one at a time. No. I think we do, actually. But uh, If I can answer your question, too. Sure. I'm also not looking at taking anything out of that housing bucket because we've obviously seen what the market's doing to us. Oh, Is it working? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. We're obviously not looking at taking anything out of that unhoused or the housing bucket. We're looking at those other categories in terms of where some of the cost savings will show itself because of exactly of what you just said. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so let's ask the city attorney, uh, do you want to clarify whether we can move these as one item or do we need to do three different motions? Mayor and Council, either way, if it was on the consent agenda, you could have done them all at once. So. If you wanted to do them all at once, that would be fine. Okay. Okay. Well, then I uh, I would move items 9, G, H, and I, resolutions 2022, 67, 68, and 69. Second. Thank you. That's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, seconded by Councillor uh, Martin. Let's vote, please. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, that passed unanimously with Councillor Hidalgo faring absent. Thank you, Harold. Thank you for that creative financing. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard anything quite like that. You did a good job, Molly and Eugene. Thank you. So we are now, um, we are now at the end of our meeting. We have general business with our fireworks discussion, which I can see some ladies very happy about. Um, who is going to lead this? Would you? Can, can I? Can we get a five? I need a five-minute break. Oh, absolutely! Thanks. Thank you. Five-minute break. That's right. I'm setting this. You are? Great. Which one did you? I think you've done five. I don't know. Well, I totally understand flubbing up, so don't, don't worry about it.
Oh, that Carolina. makes a huge difference, yes. yes. You're allowed a mistake. But it's two, though, in the same meeting. Oh, well, then you're out. So I have, like, 15 years of zero, and then I have two in one meeting. That's the best thing I can say about it. Oh, I love that phrase. That's very good, Steph.
Did it go off? Yeah. Sorry. What, two minutes ago? <laughs> no, maybe 25, 30 seconds. Oh, okay, we're good. Um, there you are. So it says Bruce Helen at the bottom. Oh, no, I'm oh, sorry. Here. Yeah, he is very concerned and he has some legitimate questions and concerns about. Uh, Spring I'll let you write down his. Yes. Spring Gulch. Oh, you just want to take a picture? Yeah, okay. okay. If you wouldn't mind giving him a call, yeah. I don't know. We're if very familiar with, you know, for us right now, it's treating the PPE, the herbicide, and we tried it and keep it down. We'll have to look at the engineering of the last if it's a way to get out and increase that. We try to prescribe burns for new vegetation to keep the water flowing. We'll, like I said, we treat it with PPE to try to keep the herbicide and keep it down to the standard herbicide. He said, though, and this was interesting because he didn't mention this the first time he talked to us about money being, uh, federal money coming down. Yeah. That okay. So he's worth talking to, and I, I just don't want to let it go. No, Somebody I'm should. Sure Jim Instinct. Oh, you are? Yep. You right. guys are great. Five minutes are up. Thank you. Um, I think um, City Manager, Assistant City Manager Sandy Cedar is going to kick off this uh, fireworks discussion. Yes, thank you, Mayor Peck, members of Council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. And I'm kicking it off because I made a transposition error in your council communication. So before we got kicked off on this uh, presentation, I just wanted to point out that when you take a look at the council communication, we are sharing with you the number of fireworks calls for service within this period of time, June 27th through July 11th. And I accidentally transposed these numbers. So in 2020, the fireworks calls for service were 810, and the other calls for service were 3,869. And the same thing with 2021. So in 2021, there were 470 fireworks calls for service and 4,041 other calls for services. Um, the tickets issued column is correct. <laughs> So I just wanted to correct that before we jump into the full presentation because I know there's been some errors in reporting because of, uh, because of my error, so my apologies. Okay. So with that, I'll turn it over to Harold so he can kind of lay out what's happening and what we're uh, proposing. Great. Yeah, Mayor Council, um, so obviously fireworks has been something that we've been talking about for a while and in, in the issues associated with it. Um, and if you, as we go back to the council com really want to focus a little bit on, on the numbers. And, and so um, when you look that we had 800 calls for service on fireworks and 470 calls for service on fireworks in the respective years, but then you look at the 3,869 calls and the 4,041, I really want to talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the challenges that we get into uh, and we have public safety chief artists, um, uh, deputy chief um, Satter, and deputy chief Higgins here to talk through, to help with some of these issues if you have specific questions. But when you look at the call volume of 3869 and, and, and 4041, one of the things that um, I think we need to bring out in this conversation is that of those calls that are of level one priority, what that means is that we have to assign two officers to those calls. So crashes with at least two officers, if not more. So domestic violence calls, um, assault calls, correct? Um, significant um, motor vehicle um, crashes. We have a list of level one. And so when we have officers on the street, 
um, and we get those priority calls. We're real-time shifting response to make sure that we can cover those priority calls. So it doesn't mean if we have, let's because we bring on extra folks at times during this, so let's assume we had 20 people on. If, if we had five level one calls, we reduce what's out in the streets at that point in time in half. And so I think that's part of, that's what I really wanted to start off with because we have to understand that not every call is a one officer call response. And um, in the severity of calls is always changing as we're responding. Um, when we look at what was the problem we were talking about, the problem that we were talking about was illegal fireworks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what generated most of the issues is just the amount of fireworks that we were seeing that are already illegal in the state of Colorado. Um, I would say in talking to my counterparts in various cities, this is not unique to Longmont. This is something that um, almost every city has been going through. And I'll talk a little bit about Fort Collins later. There were some things brought up regarding the, the fire damage or the, the fire threat and what we were seeing. One of the things that I wanted to point out is I do have the ability based on the environmental conditions to ban all fireworks uh, or to ban legal fireworks based on the conditions. I actually have done that once in my tenure here. Um, it was in 2012. I think I had been in Longmont two months. And if you remember the, the uh, how dry we were, um, I made a lot of people happy in 2012 because I did, based on the advice of the fire marshal, um, and then, then uh, would have been Deputy Chief Van Landingham, that based on the conditions, I needed to ban it, and I did it. That was including the professional fireworks display. When we look at the numbers for 2021, and I'm going to go over a heat map a little bit later when we um, talk about what Fort Collins was doing, um, I think really what we saw was an escalation in the number of illegal fireworks in our community. Um, I think 2021 was really something that we saw that was associated with COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember um, getting, literally getting on my roof to try to see what was happening around the community. Um, and I had my kids with me and we couldn't keep count of the different areas mm -hmm. where people were um, lighting illegal fireworks. Um, and, and so obviously you saw that the number was much higher in 2020. It did reduce in 2021. Um, and so one of the things that we're challenged with in dealing with, with illegal fireworks, and I think this is an important piece to start off with, is, is that when, when you do something and you, you file it, you have to have probable cause. And from probable cause, you have to have somebody uh, when you do go to court and deal with these issues, that can testify that they've seen the individual setting off the illegal fireworks. And so no matter what ordinance we have, at the end of the day, somebody has to say that they saw the individual that was ticketed um, light the illegal firework. And so um, as we look at that issue, that's a couple of things. Either the law enforcement officer is a witness to the individual or to what, individ what has been brought up about not having neighbors testify on this. In order to have that specific identification, it's either the law enforcement officer that sees it or it's an, it's an independent witness willing to sign the summons and testify and go to court. That's just what has to happen once it reaches that point based on the conversations that we've had with the um, city attorney. Um, to date, we've, we've had some strategies, um, obviously not have been really successful strategies um, based on the number of folks that we're continuing to see um, light illegal fireworks. Um, we've put display and digital ads. We've had some targeted marketing. We've, we've had social media campaigns. As we said in the council com, um, it really is um, something that the... Um, inability to provide punitive enforcement really has, has hampered this. Um, the, the continuing concerns that we've had from residents and expressed by residents include um, fireworks before the 4th of July. I will tell you that in the neighborhood I live in, we see it. Um, I've been known to 
jump on my bike to try to figure out where it's happening and, and make calls, but even by the time I get there, you can't see it. Um, we definitely know that there's uh, frustration um, with various residents from the standpoint of those individuals who have post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, veterans with post-traumatic stress syndrome, pets, um, our older adult population, and then those that have to work at off hours um, and that have to, um, you know, that have to get up early. Um, we have met with um, protecting our people and property, the POP group, um, and they had some really good suggestions and suggestions that, um, for the most part, we agree with. Um, you, you know, they've thrown out ideas, including an ordinance that bans all fireworks similar to that of Fort Collins, um, additional promotion and community fireworks show, uh, promoting that community fireworks show, and we'll talk through that in a little bit. Open up a secondary call center to assist with the, the volume of calls and, and bringing in volunteers to assist with that. Um, creating an inter interactive map where people can report that proactively. Um, and then, you know, the last one is lobby the state legislator to change the fireworks laws in Colorado. You know, I'm going to hit that last bullet point first. What's really interesting in this is that um, the primary problem that we have is with illegal fireworks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've all talked about this, and we've said probably the best way to deal with this is if you can designate an area where people could go and light these fireworks that didn't impact individuals, didn't impact neighborhoods, Unfortunately, because of the state law that bans those fireworks, we're not able to do that because then we would be condoning violation of the state law. But almost everyone that we talk to, we think that's probably the most realistic option to, to make a change. It's really not available to us because we'd be violating state law. Um, Fort, Collins has, Fort Collins has been mentioned a lot. Let me... Sorry, I'm trying to do this left-handed. I um, haven't used my left hand in a while. Um, so I want to kind of talk about what we were seeing in 2020 in terms of calls for service. So when you see the, the 800 call, roughly 800 calls, this is kind of what it looked like in our community in 2020. When you look at the 2021 calls for service, this is what it looked like. Um, and then when you look at Fort Collins, this is actually what it looked like for them in terms of the heat map where um, fireworks were going off in their community. One of the reasons that we really reached out and spent some time talking to Fort Collins was because um, we had heard that they were an example. I had heard from other council members who had um, colleagues and connections into Fort Collins where basically they were saying that it was really bad, it's been really bad as well in, in their community. If you had a, if we had our heat map up where we created, they, they look fairly similar in that there's really high pockets of, of where they're going off. We did ask them for the other maps. Um, we had Robin Erickson really constantly on that so we could get it. This is what we were able to get in terms of presenting to you all in Fort Collins. When you look at Fort Collins, there were some interesting pieces that, that came out of that. So um, they had about in 200 entries into their online system. Um, that number was down from 500 calls the previous year, uh, a, a previous to 2016. Um, here's the interesting part. If you look at what we did, we issued three citations and two citations. Uh, Fort Collins in 2021 issued five warnings and no tickets. Um, part of what we were seeing is that Fort Collins is really taking the educational approach um, when, when they're dealing with these issues. And, and so when we looked at um, all of these components um, in terms of, and, and this is staff's perspective, um, if we issued, if we created an or ordinance um, banning all fireworks. In, in terms of um, shifting the dynamic, we're not sure that that's any more enforceable than the current law that we have in place just because the volume of 
calls that we're going to have, and you still have the same thresholds in, in dealing with that situation. Um, obviously, our public safety staff will be happy to answer uh, specific questions. What we did really like about the Fort Collins um, component is, is, is really their targeted approach and their educational campaign. Um, and so when we looked at the ideas that, was pr that were presented by um, the uh, POP group, um, additional promotion of the community fireworks show hosted by the Skyline Kiwanis, um, one of the things that, that we know we need to do, and we think we realized there was some confusion on that last year, uh, because we talked about it in terms that it was a private event, meaning the city wasn't sponsoring it. That's true, but it was not a public event open to everyone in the community. And, and so we know that we have to really clarify our um, promotion of, of that event. What we also have learned in the last week or two, Two weeks, Sandy. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, is that based on where they're um, having the community fireworks show, it actually is open to see for residents to see from more areas of the community. So what we're thinking about talking, what we're what we're going to do this year is identify those areas and those parks where there's really good vantage points for people to see the um, the Kiwanis fireworks show. And, and really market that um, so that we can get individuals going to those locations. Uh, in terms of, um, we are ready to open up a secondary call center with volunteers. Um, we didn't want to pull the trigger on that until we heard from council. We're also ready and have tested an online reporting system similar to Fort Collins that we can utilize um, in this process. And so based on the conversation tonight, um, we'll be ready to go on those uh, this 4th of July. We will be looking for volunteers in the call center um, because we're going to need volunteers to help us do this during that time frame. The other thing that we have talked about is really working the public relations component to this. And um, what, we, what we mean by that is um, utilizing street signs, um, the electric street signs, um, if we can get them, um, letting people know about fireworks and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Depending on the environmental conditions, it could be nothing's allowed based on what I'm being advised. Um, we also want to take a very targeted approach um, in terms of um, how we're communicating the impact of the illegal fireworks to people within our community. So we obviously know that post-traumatic stress syndrome is a significant issue with fireworks. Um, we want to partner um, with veteran groups within our community, whether it's the VSW, the Veterans Community Project, to really have them be a partner with us in creating a very direct and targeted communication strategy regarding the impact of fireworks to um, veterans uh, that have served our country and, and what that does to those individuals. And if you really sit down and talk to them about the impact. It's significant based on what they're dealing with. So really partnering with agencies and having the veterans groups there with us saying, you know, this is an impact of people who served our country and if we're celebrating our independence, that is a significant component to this. We also want to part with, partner with um, animal service organizations to, to communicate the impact to our animals. And part of the methodology behind this is really, we all as individuals have certain things that grab our interest. And we know that people are really involved in, in veterans projects. So we're hoping that grabs a group of people there. Um, a lot of us have pets and we deal with it. So if you have a pet, you know, how do we target that market? We also know that the fire danger is incredibly important to, to talk about right now and, and really communicating around that, that piece and, and what the impacts are to it and, and what that means to you. And talking to um, Chief Higgins, um, when we look at the fire threat, the fire threat's really with the aerial fireworks. And, um, you know, what people don't realize is that if there's an aerial firework that creates it, uh, I've seen these investigations and what happens once, if they create a bigger issue and what you can do in terms of the criminal aspects of this, and, and it's significant. And, and so we need to figure out how, 
how we can talk about those issues at the same time being very sensitive to our neighbors south of us that have recently gone through uh, the tragedy of the Marshall Fire. We know that can happen, especially if there's high winds. We know we need to communicate this, so really it's a multi-pronged strategy. We also have some signs that we had available um, for folks to pick up. Um, we didn't have a lot of folks pick them up last year, um, but we really want to work with NGLA, other groups within the community, so we can get those signs out in our neighborhoods so it's front and center in terms of what everyone's seeing. Um, so really, all of the recommendations uh, that Pop presented, we do agree with and we think we need to move on some of these things, with the exception of the ordinance, just because um, our, our opinion is based on call volumes, based on conversations that we've had with the city of Fort Collins, is that we still have an unenforceable ordinance. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that just um, continues to increase the challenge. Again, that staff's recommendation. Uh, but at this point, I really want to open it up um, for you all if you have any questions. Councillor uh, Martin. Thank you, Mayor Peck. I'm not sure which way I want to go with this. Um, I took it upon myself to invite the Veterans Community Project to come here tonight, but I was late and they were unable to arrange uh, to have anybody come to public invited to be heard. They did, however, um, write a very nice and clear statement. So if uh, it's all right, I would like to read that statement because I think it explains to the public who we should care about. And this community has showed uh, in the past that we care about these groups very much. So let's hear what they say. Uh, this was written by Alice, Al Ashley Wallace of the Veterans Community Project. Concerning the use of fireworks, it should be considered how many members of your community may be negatively affected. You may say it's only one night, but it's not. People set fireworks off all summer. Three segments of the population are particularly affected by the loud, sudden noise. Veterans with PTSD, the unhoused, and pet owners. More pets go missing on the 4th and 5th of July than at any other time throughout the year. The pups can go on for hours, even past midnight, causing pets to panic and for some become inconsolable making an evening of celebration for a family interrupted by trying to manage a pet's anxiety. While a mere annoyance for some, the hours of random fireworks going off throughout the summer can make a veteran with PTSD go into fight or flight mode, cause traumatic flashbacks, or if they have a pet themselves, spend their 4th of July evening jumping at every noise unsure of where the next pup or mortar will come from, while also trying to sue the pet. It can make the night one filled with anxiety and frustration while your neighbors are celebrating. For our unhoused, it's hard enough to sleep on the street or in a vehicle without fireworks going off at random intervals. Those experiencing homelessness in Longmont who also have pets are unable to utilize shelters and therefore have no place to take their pet to avoid the noise. Longmont has a substantial population of street homeless and individuals living in their cars. We have a large veteran population, many of whom have PTSD. We also love our pets. As such, we have unhoused veterans in Longmont with pets whose lives are made that much more difficult by excessive fireworks use in the summer. Taking these members of our community into consideration is the least we can do. Set hours of planned fireworks displays posted publicly to give our neighborhoods a heads up is a good start, but setting quiet hours and enforcing these standards in the community after celebrations is important. It shows we care about those around us who find fireworks psychologically damaging. 
please consider your neighbors. And I thought that was a pretty good statement of what a very large section of our, how a very large section of our community experiences this celebration. And the fact that we have fire danger on top of everything else is just one more thing to be anxious about. And I hear from people every day who are anxious about the fire danger and don't understand why we aren't doing the, more about that either. So I just, whatever we decide tonight, I hope that we will care about our neighbors. That's all. Thank you, Councilor Waters. That was an a emotional, in-depth letter. Um, I, okay, I, I see Councilor, I was gonna say something, but Councilor Waters, go ahead. Move the group, I'll wait. Oh, thank you. Um, to the point of education, I think that's an absolutely perfect route to go. The one thing I, I do know from just having kids and being a sibling is that um, if children are told something is wrong or illegal they and their parents do it, they tell their parents that's illegal or that's not. So I think we should start education when you have a very little time, two months, in, in our schools and um, let them know that it's illegal they all, all those kids have pets. Let them know what it happens to the pets because they can be our outreach to their parents very easily. And as far as those signs go, perhaps we should offer them to school kids to put in their yards um, instead of, well, instead of the uh, parents who may not put them in their yards. Um, the other thing that has been suggested are laser shows versus, uh, versus fireworks. That, that, that's been pretty popular and has worked in other areas. I don't know if we can do that or should we since the Kiwanis has already paid and got their event underway. So that's just my comments. Uh, Thanks, Mayor Peck. Just a few questions and then a reflection. Uh, it, it's interesting to see the data from 2020 and 2021. Do we have data from 2019? I, I know you don't have it now. But it would be interesting to see, uh, we, we would be seeing to some degree the effects of the pandemic, right? Right. In, sp in particular in 2020, a year in which we canceled um, our own community display of fireworks. Uh, so both the effects of the pandemic and then uh, the year in which we did nothing, and then obviously last year there was something. But that would be in just helpful to see that contrast. So yes. you a number right now. So um, in 2018, we had 286 calls. 2019, we had 292 calls. 2020, we had 533 yeah, that's, calls. Yeah, so that's pretty useful, right, to, right. to understand the pandemic had a big effect. There are other variables here, drought and all the other things we're talking about, but that was, I, I don't know, you know, ho hopefully that doesn't set a new pattern of behavior because we saw it again in 2021. So. In 2019, we did nothing. Last year, we, you know, we saw what happened in terms of this is not the city's deal, right? But part of that started because the, the county, Boulder County, wouldn't issue a permit, as I recall. Did, do you know, did the Kiwanis make application to Boulder County? And was there a decision made by Boulder County to issue or not to issue a permit? For this year or for yes, last year? Yes, for this year. No, I think they just proceeded on the current location based on my conversations, um, based on the event last year, the viewing area, um, and their their plans that they'd had to, to date at this point. We, we did were. meet with them about um, some other options. Um, yeah, I know there was discussion about things, places, <laughs> right. none of which were very feasible. Uh, but there was no application not, or for a permit this year that you're aware not of. Not for Boulder County. Well, let me back up. Not for the fairgrounds. So the, the application to Boulder County historically has been for the fairgrounds. Yeah. Have they submitted the application for the other site? Yes. Okay. So there is an application for the Fox. So Boulder Lake County Park. issued did the Mountain did Mountain View is it Mountain View? Mountain View. So fire were, fire district also give that permit. So that's all done. They haven't given the permits. They've made their applications, or they were making them last week. Has Boulder County 
permitted the has, fireworks? Has Those, not yet. So applications for both, no decisions yet. Correct. Right. So that's still up in the air in terms of. Did you hear? Did you get any feedback? Any, 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 or any of us? Just general feedback. I don't know if there was an evaluation of any formal evaluation of the community's reaction to moving it to Fox Hill. Did you? Because we read we read some in the paper, heard some comments. I'm just curious, what did you hear? So Mayor Peck and members of council, I think we had a couple of folks that wrote in to city staff saying, hey, this, you know, what happened? This used to be a public event and now it's a private event. And that is the way that we laid it out. Of course, we would look at it differently this year. Um, but for the most part, most of our complaints were about illegal private fireworks. Um, the Kiwanis felt that they had great support from the community on the show and realized that they could make it a much more public event than it had been. And they, they realized that um, it, didn't, it didn't feel like a public event at the Fox Hill Country Club is what they realized. And so they wanted to do a lot more marketing this year to, to really invite the public. They realized that they could have a whole lot more people in person on the golf, not on the golf course, but on the... Um, on the other side of the, the property. driving range. On the driving range. Yeah, the driving range specifically. So uh, they, To be seated they were, on the driving range. To be okay. sitting. Because there's a whole bunch of development on going on yeah. on the other side of the driving right. range right now. So they felt they got very, you know, very positive feedback. I would say we got a little bit of negative feedback, but much more negative feedback about general illegal fireworks. Well, I, as, as a council member, I certainly got my share, received my share of input on illegal fireworks. I also, as a resident, uh, uh, had a fair, uh, now fair number of conversations with neighbors about what was going on and from others. And there was, I, I do think that had an effect last year, not unlike not doing something year, the year before, moving it to Fox Hill felt to some like a pretty elitist decision, and there was a reaction to it, I Correct. think. And, and I hope that doesn't, I hope it's not the same reaction this year, if assuming that, that project gets permitted. Um, are there... Are there examples of enforce if so how how enforceable from our our first responders public safety fire how enforceable is the ordinance we have right now we've seen two and three tickets issued that either suggests it's not enforceable or we're not enforcing it so and I understand Harold what you said about the you know the the, the, the call on our staff and numbers of calls and how people get deployed this dis deployed and you only have so many people to go around right but it would be, if, if, as, as we consider these options, it'd be really useful to know if there's something from, from the perspective of police or fire that we, that we actually need to dial into or you know, amend in our ordinance to make it more enforceable when we need to enforce. Uh, Mayor, Council, I do want to stress on the numbers that we just gave you. Uh, that was from July 1st to July 6th. That the numbers in the council presentation was for two weeks. Just so in that time frame. Yeah, so the number that uh, city manager Dominguez just read were for six days from the first to the sixth. So that's why the discrepancy in the two numbers. Right. Uh, as far as enforcement, um, people don't shoot fireworks in front of us. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, people don't stay in there. smart residents. Yeah, uh, I worked the fireworks show last year. And as I would pull on a street, the street would go quiet. And as I would drive around to another street, the street would light up behind yeah. me. And so people, they're aware, they don't flaunt the fireworks rules. Uh, they go into their homes when they see the cops on the street. And uh, so that's one issue. Um, so we have to observe it in order to be able to write a ticket or a witness has to say that person, uh, my neighbor, John Smith, who lives at this house, was shooting fireworks, and I'm willing to testify. Uh, then we have to balance that with all the other calls for service sure. that we may not be able to get to that night. And then do we come back days later and issue a ticket? Do they answer their door? I mean, it, it's, it's a difficult. Yeah. It, it's not as simple as just driving to the house and writing a ticket. Cause so, Jeff, what I'm hearing you saying, that there's nothing specific in the ordinance that you would say, do these two things. Do this one thing right. that would make it more enforceable. Uh, one ordinance change I've heard that uh, Fort Collins is exploring is tying the violation to the property owner, uh, which is different. Uh, for, you know, this is at your house, yeah, yeah and then it's a civil infraction to the homeowner. Uh, you still kind of 
that would make it a little easier. We could mail the tickets and things like that. But can, can we do that legally? Eugene, as far uh, we'd have to change some ordinance. Well, I understand, but yeah. if that was a change in the ordinance, I, th I think that because that would that would be a deterrent. I would think. I think that's what we need to work with Fort Collins on because I think to the point of is their ordinance working? That's why they're looking at this other ordinance because their ordinance isn't working. And I think we just all need to be in communication. I think it's too early to say whether or not right. we can or we can't, but Eugene would have to. So that's a, that a, a, it's a no, an unknown at this moment. Right. Exactly. Or it's an undetermined if there's something specific we should do in the ordinance. Council Member Waters, Eugene May, City Attorney. So in the information provided by TNT, they did have some social host ordinances, I think primarily out of California. Uh, we have not looked specifically at uh, implementing one of those here, uh, sort of waiting for the council discussion. And if we get direction, take a look at it, we'll take a look at it. Well, I, I'd be interested to see what the line, I don't know what other council members feel like, but I've, if that's an example of being able to cite property owner as opposed to perpetrator, and that has a deterrent effect, I, I'd like to see that language, frankly. Um, what would you expect, Jeff, from, as our deputy chief of public safety, or maybe Dan or, or, or others, um, in terms of the Boulder County enforcement of their prohibition, From the is that is that just show, or do you, do you expect people to to see some kind of enforcement? Sheriffs right. actively out there citing people on and around the Fourth from, of July. From my experience in 2012, that seems like that was the only year we were successful in having our fireworks tamped down. People understood the risk, understood the dangers. And then, it, you know, this year's been compounded by all the fires around us. So yeah. I've never been to so many fires. Well, it would seem to me that, well, first of all, it'd be useful to know. Um, I mean, we've had, we've had conversations about how enforceable our ordinances are, how enforceable somebody else's ordinance are around all kinds of issues. But firearms and fireworks right. would be two good examples of you can pass a lot of laws, but if you can't enforce them, you know, what's the point? So it'd be, that would be useful to know what you, we might expect to see from Boulder County. Not about enforcement, but about education. Um, I, I wonder what the thoughts are about best and highest use of, of every resource we have available, from Longmont Public Media, to the Longmont Leader, to the Times Call, to the Museum, to the Senior Center, to service clubs, to interest groups, and put, put, you know, putting together uh, a speakers bureau, if you will, or a, a, a human resources and taking advantage, deploying people, getting them on agendas, take follow up. We, I wish we had had this conversation last Thursday night with the school board to say, you know, how can you help? I think the idea of getting word out to kids is a good idea um, for the very reasons that the mayor suggested. But uh, <laughs> we didn't talk about that last Thursday night. It just feels to me like if we're going to do it, we got to be really clear. How do we take full advantage of every resource that we control or that work with us right, to educate the public, and what are the most persuasive messages, especially if, the, if part of that's an appeal for veterans and others with PTSD or the other issues or, or you know, or animals. What's the messaging that's going to matter? Who delivers it? And what are the places we can deliver it enough times that we might make a difference? NGLA, HOAs, neighborhood groups, I mean, on and on. I know, and I know our police department does a lot of that work with neighborhood groups now on a host of issues. But it ought to be a full court press, it seems, on, on this one. And I think that's what we're saying with, that's what we're also saying with the, um, with the PR strategy and the full, it really is everything there, and this rises to the top of our list as we're heading into um, the time when this becomes an issue for us. Um, because it's, it's not something that we can do alone. You all often hear me say, we can't do everything. This is something that's going to take the entire community to come together because, I mean, you know, I've said this in meetings. This is about consideration. This is about consideration of your neighbors, your, you know, other individuals, and it's going to take all of us to, to, to be, be part of this solution. See who's next here. Hmm. 
All right, thank you, Mayor Beck. <clears throat> so first of all, I would just like to quickly ask, I know that the institutional knowledge primarily probably lies with the, our two deputy chiefs there, uh, Deputy Chief Higgins and Satter. Uh, in your time uh, in active duty, how many active fires do you remember being caused by fireworks? Mayor Peck, Councilman uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I don't have exact numbers over all the years, but actually last year we did not have any. Um, 2020, we had four. Um, that was, one came in as a structure fire, it was a smaller fire at a residence, and then uh, three grass fires. Um, we did have a year, and so I'm just going off on memory on this one, so uh, forgive me if I'm a little off, but it was 2018 or 19, we also had an arsonist in the area. So on 4th of July, somebody was going up and down the main street corridor lighting dumpsters on fire as well. So it's so one of those years we had a, a number more. Um, so I would say we've been lucky overall. We do get some smaller grass fires from it, I guess. And the idea of where people are lighting off the illegal fireworks, they're, they tend to be in the neighborhoods, so they're not hitting some of the open spaces where, where the heavier growth and things like that are. So some, in some of those ways, we're fortunate. And I do want to concur with uh, Deputy Chief Satter about 2012, because I was working the street back then. And people really took it to heart when we got the word out how dangerous it was to uh, do anything as far as ignitions anywhere in the county, and and that year was dramatically lower for calls all around and definitely the, the illegal fireworks, so. Um. So the key word I, I keep hearing is that in general, these, these fires that did occur over the last number of years have been set by illegal fireworks, the ones that leave the ground, not so much, you know, ones that are currently legal in the state of Colorado. Right. Based on memory, I can't remember a fire occurring from legal fireworks. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, that, that's very helpful. And uh, I will say that um, I think it's fairly common knowledge that my father is a retired firefighter and our family is not innocent of illegal fireworks. So just to say that, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to be, you know, sitting up here as some teetotaler as far as that's concerned. Um, <laughs> as far as some anecdotal comments that uh, Councilmember Waters was alluding to, the only folks that I've heard really complaining about the location of a community fireworks show are folks that probably uh, seem to live on the west side and south side of Longmont, further away from the newer location being more on the east side of Longmont. Outside of that, I've not heard too many complaints about the actual location of the fireworks, just that they want a community fireworks show. And that's just anecdotally what I've been hearing. Um, I think as, as we've stated in the state of Colorado, fireworks that leave the ground are already illegal. Um, so it really becomes, when we talk about a fireworks ban to me, personal fireworks versus the community fireworks show. Uh, I think that the community fireworks show is done safely, uh, at least from my recollection uh, prior to the pandemic when my father was also working as a firefighter and he was on duty on the 4th of July. The fire department was very um, aware as well as on the scene in case anything seemed to go wrong. And I grew up in Longmont. I was born and raised in Longmont. I remember when I could actually be at the county fairgrounds and laying on the ground and ash would be coming down on to me. Uh, they changed that eventually. That's probably not a safe thing to happen, but uh, I remember that as a child growing up in Longmont. So I just want to say that obviously we continue to try to make everything safer and much more um, friendly for the community. Um, and so I want to also say that I think that as we were being consistent in the pandemic, as maybe we're not out of the pandemic yet, but we're, we're being consistent with 
our authorities at the county level and the state level. I think we should, as the city of Longmont, continue to be consistent with our county partners and our state partners. And so if our county sheriff, currently Joe Pelly, uh, decides that we need to have this kind of ban, I would support that as a council member to be consistent with the county. Um, and uh, on top of that, I think before we go further with a similar ban that does not seem to be very effective uh, that the city of Fort Collins has put that has enacted. Um, I, I don't think that our ban on smoking on main street is very effective. I don't think our ban of folks riding bicycles and wheeled things downtown is very effective. Uh, and so I don't think that putting an all out ban on personal fireworks would be effective uh, I do understand if we did put the ban on the community fireworks show because we do have con some control over that, if you will. Um, what I would like to see is maybe uh, as far as um, enforcement is concerned that when we have the opportunity uh, in public safety that we are not giving out warnings uh, for firework infringement problems we are moving straight to the citation mm -hmm. um, and so I think that would be an increased level of enforcement before we go to an all-out ban like I said that has questions about efficacy and so th those are my thoughts and and thank you for your answers to my questions and so looking forward to other comments Councillor uh, Yarbrough Thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, thank you all for the research that you've done um, with Fort Collins and the information you provided us. Um, I guess um, one of the questions that I had is if, and I'm not trying, I'm not saying I see this happening or anything, but if there was a fire, because I was going to ask the same thing, how many fires have we had due to the fireworks? But if there is a fire, what is the protocol moving forward? If there is a fire due to fireworks and it caused a neighborhood fire, what would be the protocol after that dealing with fireworks? I mean, have we all have we thought about that? Illegal fireworks. Um, Mayor Peck, Council Member, Council Member Yarborough, um, we have had a discussion about that. There is a protocol in place. Um, if there is a fire that is generated from fireworks, um, there is an investigation that is done. We have arson investigators uh, that work for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, they will investigate that if we can determine that the fire is caused uh, by fireworks or the legal, legal use of fireworks. Uh, then there could potentially be criminal and also civil uh, penalties uh, for those fires. So moving forward after that, um, will we put anything in place? You know what I'm saying? I guess what I'm trying to figure out, because um, I heard this last summer when I was visiting, coming in here, listening to our constituents and their concerns about the fireworks. So, um, of course, if we can prevent it, that's number one, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I guess I know that we don't have control over what other people do. We can put um, ordinances in place, and obviously we're having a hard time really enforcing a lot of it. Um, but I guess my concern is, and maybe not even a concern, I just have a question. I really want to know what would be the protocol if something like that happened afterwards. So you put them in jail what would be the city's protocol to prevent that moving forward if that would happen? And how can we, what measures would we take for, for the community after that? I think I understand what you're asking, Councilman Yarbrough. I think the, the problem in lies is that we can't control people's free will. Um, and so folks make a decision every single day, and most of us do. If we drive on the highway, we, we exceed the, the city uh, speed limit that's assigned. And so if you're caught by an officer, you're cited for that. If you're not, then you happen to get away with it that day. 
in the cases that you're talking about is when we have a situation to where a firework was to cause property damage or significant damage to, to something. Uh, the state of Colorado already has uh, a host of things that deal with arsons or types of fires. Um, and so there is such things as reckless conduct. There, there are things that individuals can be charged with. Now, a lot of those times is that, of course, they have a uh, judicial process. They go through courts. They have to be found guilty. Um, and then, again, courts and probation can do different a variety of things for them. If they want to, the courts want to decide that you can't have fireworks while you're on probation, then that's something the judge could institute. I don't know that there's anything from a city standpoint that this council uh, could do to enact once someone was convicted of a crime uh, to add on additional penalties for that. What you do have in place is you do have an ordinance that exists that we are able to enforce when we're able to, to meet the certain elements and requirements uh, in order to present that in front of a judge to get a conviction or present enough evidence to let the judge decide that. If someone was to be reckless in their conduct in usage of fireworks, either illegal or illegal, there is still a, um, a, a criminal repercussion, potential re criminal repercussion. But again, there's also a civil penalty that would be handled by the, the property owner who was victimized. Um, so again, to answer your question, I don't know that there is anything that the city could do to hold an individual accountable. Uh, that is really what the judicial system is for, uh, and, and that's the place of the judge and, and juries to decide whether or not an individual is guilty of whatever that crime is. But there are protocols in place within public safety, both where police and fire work together to investigate uh, fires. I get a report on a monthly basis on all the fires that we have within Longmont and what the investigators found in their investigation into those fires. Some of those are just simply unknown because the dumpster was set on fire. Some of those, hey, it's because there was a mechanical failure with a car while the individual was working on that. And then some of those may uh, very well have to do with, well, we have a potential issue where an individual wanted to file an insurance claim and so they set a piece of property on fire. And so we do prosecute those and follow up with those um, both on, as a combination of both police and fire. And I think if I can jump in, if you're saying, I mean, I think part of the challenge with this is, um, and I'm going to key off of what um, Deputy Chief Higgins said. Um, when we've had fire related to fireworks, it's typically been illegal fireworks. Um, he couldn't think of one where it was legal fireworks. Part of the challenge is they're already illegal. And, and I think that's the challenge in this is um, they're not supposed to have them anyway. And, and they're still setting those fireworks off. And, and, and so I'm not sure honestly what you could do because they're already participating in that behavior anyway and that's why I said there's a point of this where it's it's really consideration and and it's understanding it um, you know absent catching them when they're coming in from Wyoming or some of the other states I think that's really the crux of the issue they're already participating in, a, in an illegal behavior it's just that the volume is so high that it's tough on the enforcement side. So I don't know what necessarily would change other than if we see that for some reason there's a rash of legal fireworks that are doing something. But to date, we haven't, haven't really had that evidence. Thank you. I just think it's really tough and, and I understand you all can only do what you can do and what you can see. And I also understand that neighbors who don't want to turn their neighbors in because they have to live next to them. And I get that as well. At the same time, that consideration is highly important um, for our community. And it's a matter of, it can be a matter of life and death as well. So, you know, I think it's important for us as council to, to, to look at I know that we can't enforce everything and it's hard, but how we can have some preventatives as well. And I think the education piece is highly important, educating our community and as Mayor Peck said, educating kids in the schools and um, is very important. Um, but when we're talking about where we are with the county and the fire risk, um, we really, really need to look at that much more closely because that's, that is a matter of life and death. So we can't, also, we can't determine if somebody's going to consider their neighbors or not, right. you know. Um, and then not only that, putting our officers out there, taking them away from real dangerous calls that 
could be a matter of life and death as well. Um, so I just, you know, I was just listening to everyone and I'm thinking, what can we do to prevent? What measures can we take to prevent those illegal? And I know they're going to do it anyway, but educational course is important. And what else can we do? Because we don't want that to be tomorrow's news that a neighborhood or July the 5th news that our, a neighborhood was burned down because of illegal fireworks. So I just want to make sure we do what we can and put our brains together as to how we can prevent it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just a, if, a quick second, I just want to comment. Councilman Yarbrough, I, <clears throat> I understand where you're coming from. And one of the things that we have not done in the past and something we were talking about doing is once the 4th of July is over with, we average about 300 calls if you look over a period of about four or five years other than 2020. For some reason, it was a ridiculous number. One of the things we don't do a very good job of is following up after that. We receive a lot of information in. So we're hoping that um, with council's recommendation for us to continue to move forward uh, with the heat map, we'll actually receive addresses. And so we're looking at what can we do after July 4th to follow up with those homeowners just to give them an idea to let them know, hey, listen, we just want you to be consciously uh, aware that, you know, we've received some information, there's fireworks, there's issues within your community, there's concerns, whether it is with the, with the veterans, uh, whether it's animals or whether it is uh, just the weather, con the overall conditions of the, the weather, the property, the dryness. And so we're looking at what can we do to educate folks after the 4th to follow up with those residents and that information that we get um, during the July 4th. Because again, if you get 90 calls in an hour, it's hard to get to all 90 calls. So we have time after that to, to, to get back with those residences that we can identify and educate them, uh, specifically educate them, and then document that we did have an opportunity to, to, to either meet or to, uh, to engage them in some way, whether it's a letter or, or what it is. So we are looking at those things. So beyond the fact, uh, to your point, we are looking at what can we do after July 4th to also address that. Thank you. And I also think that once we have that information, maybe we can have the NGL, NGL come around maybe for the 4th and have block parties on the 4th of July and have food and music and things like that to prevent that if we can, maybe yes, in those areas that are concentrated with, with that activity. So that could be something. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Chief. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I think that's also a good point. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, too, is where it's concentrated. We're not necessarily seeing it where we have registered um, neighborhood associations. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what we were seeing from the map. So if you kind of tie it with what we want to do and really engage in that more, but that's another connection that we're seeing. But we, we agree and we've talked about that with um, Wayne and Carmen. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Mr. Dominguez, in 2012, you made the decision to shut down fireworks because of conditions on the ground. Um, what decision-making process will you use this year? Um, same Based, same. Well, well, I mean, in detail, weather conditions, what Boulder County does, all of it. Um, weather conditions, conditions uh, specifically with inside our corporate jurisdiction because so one of the challenges in this that's a little bit different is that, um, and I kind of want to get into the Boulder County fire restrictions too. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at the restrictions that they put in place, for the most part, um, and we've talked um, last week, um, Captain Goldman and Deputy Chief Higgins and I had this conversation. Most of the things in the county's um, fire restrictions are already prohibited in, within the city. Um, the fireworks piece was the only one that really wasn't. And so the example is at a park, you can't put a, you can't have a fire on the ground. Mm -hmm. You can put it in the barbecue pit, which actually when you look at Boulder County's restrictions, um, you can build, maintain, attend, or using a fire in a constructed permanent fire pit or fire grates within developed recreation sites. They had a map and on private lands. That's what it is for us all the time. Uh, use of portable stoves, lanterns, using gas, jelly, petroleum, pressurized liquid fuel, or fueling closed sheep herder type, type stove. And, and so the only, frankly, difference that, that we saw, and Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, between what are in our ordinances and, and, and the county's ordinance is, and I just want to touch on this to kind of perspective, is really the fireworks piece. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to be looking at, and Dan, and Dan can answer this question too, 
one of the things that, that we're also concerned with is that right now, if you use utilize legal fireworks, you're, you're tend to going to use that in your driveway in areas that aren't necessarily associated with combustible materials. Um, you know, similar to illegal fireworks, if people want to do it and they start moving into different areas, then that's where it becomes an issue because it really is kind of in those open space areas um, or um, certain neighborhoods have, my neighborhood has um, high grass behind it. Um, that's what we're going to be looking at and, and ultimately the fire danger based on the conditions that we're seeing at this time. Um, and it's something that we're going to be talking about on a regular basis to really go, where are we? What is it? What are we going to look at? I think when I made the decision in 2012, it was middle of June, um, middle to first part of June when we were starting to see it and, and that was occurring. Um, but it, yeah, we're just going to look at all the environmental factors, the risk factors, and, and really it's going to be a pretty pragmatic decision based on what we're seeing on the ground at that time. And frankly, what rain we if we have rain between now and then and what that's going to look like. Could if, be earlier this year if we don't have any rain. Yeah, if we haven't had any rain, say by the 1st of July, do you think there'd be a ban then? I think if we haven't had any rain and we're as dry as we are now, if, mm -hmm. if the first part of June, that's gonna be the decision-making timeline, not the 1st of July. So very early. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna, that's why I say, we're gonna be looking at those environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my, my tulips, opened to uh, this weekend and I hadn't watered them and they died and withered the same day that they opened. Uh, <laughs> I should have watered, <laughs> but uh, it's really dry. Mm -hmm. um, whose recommendations will you be taking? And you know, this is, this is for anybody, but uh, you know, is it, is it a clear cut decision or is it gonna be a hard agonizing decision? No, I think typically when you get to those points, it's pretty clear cut. Okay. Uh, you know, um, I think last time when I had to do it in 2012, it's here's the conditions, here's what we're having. And it's like, all right, let's do it because the conditions are warranting it. It's okay. not something for me that, you know, what if this or what if that. It's here's what the conditions are, here's what we're going to do. Not unlike when we have any natural disaster and you have to make decisions very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, this question is probably for chief artists or perhaps the city attorney. Um, I've had a lot of people write to me with uh, suggestions or message me on social media with suggestions that involve, why don't the police just something? And something without enumerating them typically involves a violation of their neighbor's constitutional rights. Uh, can somebody give me a, a, a five minute explanation or a two minute explanation or whatever it takes about why we can't just go point to their fireworks and say, look here, you know, to let, can you talk a little bit about an illegal search and, and what it would take for, you know, if, if I said, well, you know, my neighbors across the street move all the time, so I don't know their names and I'm not sure which unit they live in, but I saw a match in that guy's hand. You know, I'm not gonna be able to go to court and swear, because I don't know those people. But what's the, what's the barrier to me enlisting the police or, a, or the fire department in, in nailing those people down? Mayor and Council, Eugene May again. I think you're asking about the Fourth Amendment search and seizure protections. Probably I am. And basically your house is your castle mm -hmm. and the police uh, in limited circumstances can go in and there is an exhaustive case law of, uh, on all sorts of different fact patterns. But basically police can't go in without a warrant or a warrantless search and a warrantless search you know, maybe the most common would be exigent circumstances if they're going to be destroying evidence or there's a high likelihood of further injury or damage. Uh, police can go in in those circumstances. Um, but 
it's a dicey area of law. And, uh, you know, I think the first um, underlying principle is police can't go in unless they have a real good reason. And those real good reasons are your warrants or your exigent circumstances. Exigent Counselor. circumstances is, is a uh, word that's not going to mean very much to a lot of people <clears throat> listening. Um, so can, can you clarify that a little bit? And what would you have to do? What would you do if you had to write an ordinance that would establish probable cause? Counselor Martin. I know. Okay. Don't care. Mayor Peck, uh, council members, Zach Hart is public safety chief. Um, Councilman Martin, I, I don't, exigent circumstances just simply means in the layman's terms is there's typically um, what it's used for is there's evidence of a crime that can be disposed of uh, very quickly by the individual. And so there are certain things, uh, there's warrant, exigent circumstances pertains to certain motor vehicles, uh, plain view doctrine, certain things that, that we can do. Uh, this does not pertain to fireworks. Uh, really what I think, what, what would answer your question and really it, those folks that are going to ask kind of constitutionally why we can't do something, you really want to focus in on um, the Fifth Amendment, which is due process. It is the process of where you have a right to have your case heard. It's where you have a right to present evidence. It's where you have a right to defend yourself. And it's where you have a right to basically confront your accusers. And so when you talk about why can't the police just do this, it's because we have to establish probable cause and then either issue the summons or make the arrest for whatever the crime it is. But then that individual has due process that then protects them from incriminating themselves. So I think a lot of that, it's a very complex subject and it can't simply be answered in this situation, this situation, this situation. Every situation is different and the courts look at situations different, whether it's your home whether it's a vehicle, whether it's open space, whether it's private or public property, the courts apply different standards to those as far as search and seizure, what we can do as far as action circumstances and those types of things. And I think the other answer to that question is probable cause is fact specific. So you can't proactively create probable cause um, because it's dependent on the facts of the situation. Um, that's the other piece of it. So, so we do have what's called our articulable suspicion, which means, uh, let's say someone, it's, it's at night, they're walking through, it's midnight, and they're walking through a dealership. Articulable suspicion is we have a belief that an individual is, is either involved, was involved, or is about to commit a crime. That gives us the illegal authority to have contact with that individual and find out, hey, why are you here after midnight at a car lot? You know, we've had break-ins in the past, what's going on? But in order to actually to, to arrest and seize that individual, we have to have what's called probable cause. So while we may have articulable suspicion that someone is shooting fireworks off at their house, in order to actually issue that citation, we have to be able to see that action. So while we may have articulable suspicion that, that for, I'll give you that Jeff sped here tonight in his car because he was running late, unless I observe that or someone else observed that and, and said, hey, I'm willing to come and testify at court that Jeff was speeding, we can't issue that citation for probable cause. And so that's where we're having that difficulty uh, with the fireworks. Because while we can see the firework go off in a general area, by the time that we get there, as Deputy Chief Satter had mentioned, they're already gone, or the fireworks are already disposed of. And so it's not prosecutable. Is, is there reasonableness to believe that they shot the fireworks? Absolutely. But is there probable cause in order to be able to issue the citation to the standard that the courts require us to do? The answer is no. I have a follow-up question. So the mayor doesn't want me to ask my follow-up question. And Councilman Martin, I'll be more than happy to, to have a conversation with you after council to, to address whatever concerns or questions that you may have. Councilor, oh, excuse me. Is, yep, <laughs> Councillor Waters. You know, this is this is not about fireworks. This is about your interpretation of the rules. I understand when we have an issue and we're in first reading, 
the, the, what you want to do to limit discussion to five and three. I get that in two rounds. But w when we are, this, this is a general discussion. We're trying to learn something, learn our way forward on something where we don't have clear answers. To arbitrarily, and you've done it capriciously, to impose arbitrarily, and I don't know if you're keeping track or not, a five-minute restriction seems unreasonable and, and supports make us making decisions or promotes us making decisions based on ignorance ba rather than information. So I object to that. I object to the ruling of the chair, and I don't need a second motion to get, a, to get a, an, an action on my objection. Thank you. Is there an action on this objection? I am going to stick to, to the protocols that we have. I, I don't know what I'm an elected official. This is a public meeting, and I will not be muzzled. And I don't think you have the authority to muzzle any elected official. We're, we're an elect, in a public meeting in this kind of discussion. And, I, and I, So just let it be known, I'm not going to just be quiet when you impose, I think, a rule unreasonably. Thank you. Um, so this has been a robust discussion, and I look forward to what uh, you come back with in June, what, what the county does, what, what we decide to do. Uh, I, I think that if, you, if we have a ban based upon fire, that's probably a different education piece. What I am concerned about a full out ban is that we are in a different political climate than we were in 2012. And I don't want it to look like a ban as a disciplinary action rather than a safety action. So uh, those are just my thoughts. Um, I assume on the other items in terms of the educational campaign and everything I outlined, is that something that council wants us to proceed with in the mapping and those issues? The only question is, and this is going to take some research, is this, um, what do you call it, Eugene? The social host, do you all want us to look at that? Um, we're not sure we can do it or not. Any comments on that, uh, looking at the social host? Okay, uh, can you bring out the, the language of the, the social host? Uh, We'll, okay. we'll look at whether we can do it. I don't know that we can do it. I just know that Fort Collins is looking at it, and we can reach out to them, see what they're doing. And, and, and then after you find out what that is, you can bring it back to us. Okay. Okay, that would be great. Any other? Um, so what's, what's that question, Sandy? Mayor Peck, members of council, um, we were just wondering about firework stands, because if we're waiting to determine a ban until we get closer to that. We're holding permits because we wanted to make sure you had this conversation first. Are you comfortable with us moving forward with permits on those legal firework sales? And then, of course, if we get to a point in June where it's banned, that's no different than 2012. I, yes, and I do think that we need to hold a vote on that because um, it's a state. It's a state uh, law that we can have legal fireworks. Correct. So we don't really want to go... Can we have a motion? Councillor Martin. I have a question. I would like to ask whether the city would consider a buyback program if we permit early and then um, people have bought things and they can't use them. And if so, how would that be funded? Because that would affect my vote. I think we did that in 2012, didn't we? No, I, so I, I think if council is not interested in a ban on legal fireworks, then I think that goes directly to then we could allow mm -hmm. fireworks stands. But in 2012, when we banned it, I don't think we did a buyback. Um, and I think what we just need to be overt in is saying there's no guarantees right now that you can even fire legal fireworks based on the environmental conditions. But I think absent a ban on legal fireworks, I mean, I don't know why we wouldn't continue with what we've normally done. Um, I think that's the connection, Sandy. 
And I didn't hear counsel say you wanted to ban legal fireworks. So I think that answered that question. Any comments on uh, that? A comment that Councillor uh, Martin, Councillor Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Peck. Um, I, I think you, this is like a lot of things. I think you, you make that purchase at your own risk, and I think people ought to know it. And if you know if I buy them and can't use them, it's like a lot of things that I buy and can't use. And to answer that question, um, Deputy Chief Higgins just said they don't go bad in a year. So if we did it, they could use them the following year as well. So do we have a motion then on... Um I don't think we need one. It's since you didn't act on the banning of legal fireworks, then there's no need for the motion. Correct. Okay, and and I do would like to address the buyback. Um, I wasn't sure if you meant buyback of legal or the illegal fireworks, or all of them. Oh, only legal. That's what I thought. Okay. Do you need anything else from us on it? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this, and all the work that you're doing on it. Now we have Assistant Manager Sandy Cedar on our 2022 legislative bills that she rec the city recommends. Thank you, Mayor Peck, members of council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager, and this is the last legislative update for the session. Your next meeting will be May 10th, and they are planned to adjourn sine die May 11th. So, um, But there's some really good bills in this one, so let me just go ahead and go through them. So the first one is House Bill 221306, concerning broadband deployment grant processes implemented by the Broadband Development Board. So there were significant ARPA funds that were placed in the hands of the state for all kinds of things, including broadband deployment. This would actually make some changes to the current broadband deployment bill <laughs> that would allow a little longer time frame for projects and give some more flexibility. So because of that, uh, and because we have had some of these grants and been able to do some of these projects, uh, staff supports House Bill 221306. Any discussion on this uh, bill? Somebody want to make a motion to support it? So moved. Second. All those in favor of supporting this bill, please raise your hand. All those opposed? So that bill passes uh, unanim unanimously with uh, Councillor Hidalgo faring absent. Thank you very much. The next bill is House Bill 22-1355, and this is the creation of the Producer Responsibility Program for Statewide Recycling. What this would do is, is it would give some incentives to those who are producing plastics um, and, and things that can be recycled but sometimes aren't recycled. Um, and it will also charge, um, not a tax, but a fee to all of those producers to be able to create more markets when it comes to recyclable material. The hope is that by giving incentives to produce um, more green products and then also a fee to help fund uh, the recycling across the state. Currently the city does have recycling but not everywhere in the state does. This would require that. Um, that this is a, a funding source that then would create more recycling within the state of Colorado. So because this is part of our sustainability goals, um, the staff recommends the city council support House Bill 221355. I move that you support. Second, I would like to ask questions. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Uh, my understanding when I read the, re the legislation and the report is that uh, for municipalities like Longmont, who does have recycling, that it would actually be an influx uh, of some funding for us to expand our program. Is that accurate? Yes, that is that's the that is what it looks like right now. It's not all the way through the process, but if it passes as it sits today, that's true. Okay, well, I mean, obviously that would be a net gain net for gain. Longmont. And uh, as we are looking at a, a universal recycling ordinance coming up here in the next year, at least, I assume, you know, because we've been talking about it recently. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'd second it. I just wanted to clarify that for a city like Longmont, that th there's... Uh, positive uh, ramifications as well, not just for those communities that don't currently have recycling programs. True, good point, thank you. Okay, so that motion's been made by Councillor Martin, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. All those in favor of passing 1355 or supporting it, raise your hand, all those opposed. So that passes unanimously with Councillor Hidalgo Faring absent. 
Thank you. The next bill is House Bill 221377 concerning the creation of the Connecting Colorado Experiencing Homelessness with Services Treatment and Housing Program Support Grant Program. Um, again, this is another grant program that the state is proposing that would really help to connect homeless uh, people experiencing homelessness with services. And so we can take all the help we can get. This yep. is obviously a priority of the City Council, and so staff recommends that the City Council support this bill, House Bill 221377. So I move that we support House Bill 1377. So that's been moved by me, seconded by Councillor uh, Yarbrough. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? So that passes unanimously with Councillor Hidalgo Faring absent. Thank you, Mayor. The next one is House Bill 22-1378, concerning the Denver Metropolitan Regional Navigation Campus to grant to address homelessness. This is a bill that would create a campus in Denver that would help to, um, you know, basically help people who are experiencing homelessness. While this wouldn't necessarily affect Longmont directly, in fact, we're kind of unclear how it would affect Longmont, since homelessness is a regional issue, and this may be something that we want to pilot in Boulder County, um, staff suggest that City Council support this bill. House Bill 22-1378. I move 1378, House Bill 1378. Second. So uh, that's been moved by me, seconded by Mayor Pro Tim. All those in favor? All those opposed? That passes unanimously with Councillor Hidalgo Faring absent. Thank you, one more. Um, we've got kind of a gamut of different topics today. Senate Bill 22-198, concerning measures to address orphaned wells in Colorado and in connection with creating Orphan Wells Mitigation Enterprise. So what this would do is this would create an enterprise fund at the state that would really try to figure out what's happening with Orphan Wells um, and either get them closed or get them monitored or whatever that looks like. Now in the city in the city of Longmont, we don't have technically any Orphan Wells because they have to have been abandoned by their uh, company. But if we do in the future, this kind of funding would help to make sure that those are safe. So because of that, um, and oil and gas safety is a priority to the city council, staff recommends that they that you support Senate Bill 22-198. So um, I'll move that one too. Uh, support 22-198. All those in favor? Oh, so do I have a second? Thank you. I moved uh, House Bill 22-198, seconded by Councillor Yarbrough. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? So that passed unanimously with uh, Councillor Hidalgo Faring absent. I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. Not a question, a statement though. I support that because even though we don't have any wells in Longmont to close, we have fracking lines. And if those wells are not closed properly, then those lines could be trouble. So thank you. Thank you for your support this legislative season. Um, if you have any questions as things wrap up, please let me know. So we are at the end. Uh, we are final call public invited to be heard. Is there anybody in the public that would like to make comments at this time on any subject? Okay. Brian Johnston. I just want to throw out that in terms of ways to address Fifth Amendment due process, um, there's ways other than having a person with the witness come to court. Probably the best evidence, if people want to call in and say, hey, my neighbors are setting things off, video evidence is pretty, should, I would think would be substantial enough evidence to at least allow for ticketing and probably stand up in court. Um, I've had that, a similar situation happen. I one time caught a guy, crack a, head, crack a guy over the head with a beer bottle on video. And when the police showed up, I showed them that video and they arrested the guy. Uh, so... If you want a way to provide evidence without perhaps having to p force people to be dragged into court to to uh, testify against their neighbor, suggest you know perhaps the volunteer group they were talking about setting up the volunteer call in line or 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 have the people at, on the police line say get us video evidence that should be substantial enough to at least ticket them. But I, I, I I'll let you, Eugene give the final. Uh, on that, but it's just an idea. I thought that that, that might be something that might uh, might help get the issue addressed. Thank good, you. good suggestion. Thank you. Um, Britain, I think, has a comment. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Just maybe to save everybody a little bit of time, I wanted to throw out a resource. The uh, American Pyrotechnics Safety and Education Foundation does have an education program that is designed. The curriculum is already done 
for grade school all the way through uh, 12th grade. And that curriculum is free, it's available online, it's very robust, and it might interest you in the school since that was mentioned tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wants to uh, make a comment? It looks like now not, so uh, do we have any mayor and council comments? Yeah. Councilor Yarbaugh. Yes, I just want to say thank you, Mayor. I just want to say that um, the last few few days ago, um, I am a liaison for the Housing and Human um, Advisory Board, and one of our members, uh, Karen Phillips, passed away. And I just want to bring that, you know, just bring that to our attention because she has served a lot in this city and to as much as we have problems, you know, some challenges of people getting on, good people to get on these boards, um, I just wanted to bring that up to, you know, you know, send good thoughts to her family and her son. And, um, you know, I thank our community for those of you who are on boards and you make a difference. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, now, city manager comments. Uh, Mayor Council, I did want to provide you all with an update. Um, I know you all have had a lot of calls about loud cars, whether it's mufflers, radios, and things like that. I know uh, Mr. Johnson's been here, uh, but we've also had it from neighborhoods. Um, uh, Public Safety Chief Artists and uh, De um, Deputy Chief Satter have been working with Elizabeth Lorena Mills on an ordinance that will as we were talking about um, how we can enforce um, that will make it easier for officers to enforce and they're going to be bringing that to you all in the near future um, but I just know you all have been receiving a lot of emails and I wanted to give you an update that they're they're bringing something forward that we think we can operationalize that's good news thank you um, city attorney Eugene no comments mayor thank you so seeing that all of our comments are done. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. So that's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Councilor Yarbrough. All those in favor, raise your hand. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.